On this Father's Day, we are at Michigan International Speedway. More people are in attendance at this two-mile oval than ever in its 18-year history. The reason? This man. In a matter of minutes, this 28-year veteran, 200-time winner, will receive the command to fire his engine. In doing so, he moves to a new, possibly unreachable plateau in motorsports history. Today, CBS Sports is proud to bring you Richard Petty's 1,000th Grand National Winston Cup race. $476,000 Michigan 400. It's a gray day here. It rained earlier, but it's clearing off, and we're in for what we anticipate to be a great race. See the temperature at an easy 67 degrees, but there's a very special warmth radiating around this magnificent racing facility. Hello, I'm Ken Squire, and the real story of this day is Richard Petty. Everyone wants to be part of the celebration as he reaches this milestone. Take a look at his record over the years in victories against other drivers, the very best. He's had some 200 wins. There you see David Pearson with 105. And your co-host today, Ned Jarrett, with 50. You also took a couple of national titles away from him as well. This must be a very special moment for you, Ned. Ken, this is a very special day. If any athlete in America de deserves to be called a superstar, it's Richard Petty. It's hard to believe that he started his career in 1958, about eight months before I started my Grand National career in 1959, and I've been retired for 20 years, but he's still going strong. In fact, I think that he can be a factor in this race today. Another major factor today is speed. Tim Richmond shattered Bill Elliott's year-old record by some six and a half miles per hour. And 38 of the starting 41 cars are over Elliott's old mark. So we're going to see a lot of speed, a lot of action, and it will be the typical, traditional CBS flag-to-fly -flag coverage. Please stay with us for the Michigan 400. This CBS Sports Special, the Michigan 400, from the Michigan International Speedway, is sponsored by Ford and your Ford dealer. Have you driven a Ford lately? Bud Light. Everything else is just a light. And by Goodyear Eagles. You either have Goodyear Eagles or you need them. A six and a half mile per hour escalation in speed is more than drivers and engines. With that story, here's the editor publisher of the National Speed Sport News, Chris Economaki. The speeds produced in qualifying are directly attributable to a $650,000 resurfacing job that involved 8,000 tons of asphalt and brought qualifying speeds up to 172 miles an hour, making for a multitude of changes for crews and drivers. <coughs> driver their prized black books where the chassis setting spring rates and rear axle ratios was completely rewritten during practice and qualifying drivers say now they don't have to allow for sliding room because the cars stick better in the turns and for fans that could mean more side-by-side -side racing in the corners the drivers also say they drive deeper into the corners which mean to the crews more downforce and stiffer springs and because the tires haven't been tested here it could mean that cars will need tires before they need gas which would be a first in stock car racing Ken the, the track is faster, but it's just as dangerous as ever. Yesterday, Rick Baldwin, 31 years old, out of Martinsville, Virginia, these days originally a fine racer out of Corpus Christi, Texas, was attempting to qualify the Buddy Arrington car number 67, diving into turn number one. One small miscalculation here. The car revolves, it slaps the wall. 
Baldwin sustained head and neck injuries. He is in critical condition in a Jackson, Michigan hospital today, still unconscious from that terrible crash. We'll update you with any further news we have on that story. A year ago, the major story here at this track was Bill Elliott. If you'll recall, he came into the event having won six events and claimed this is his seventh. This year, he has three fifth-place finishes thus far to account for. With more on Bill Elliott, here's Mike Joy. Well, thank you, Ken, and happy Father's Day, Dad. Here's a guy who gave his dad a great Father's Day present right here, two years running, a trip to Victory Lane. But this year's been a little different. You're still getting the media attention, but it's of a different kind than you had last year. Well, no doubt about it. We've had our problems this year, in which really we've run about the same and everybody seems to have kept caught up and passed us. That's the kind of thing that happens in this sport on a cyclical basis, kind of year after year. What can you folks do to catch up to what the GM cars are running now? You know, right now, I just feel like that we just try to keep working, continue to work through this year. You know, maybe hope things will be better in 87. Can you do it today? Well, I'm going to try as hard as I can. And that's the only way he knows how to run. This car is a virtual duplicate of the one that Elliott ran here last year with one difference. NASCAR now allows all the teams and makes of cars to run a new air dam type front spoiler that helps improve the flow of the air up and over the car and around the sides. Well, if Elliott's not on the front row, let's go meet the man who is with Chris Economaki. I'm with Tim Richmond, the fastest of the fast, 172.031, a new record, Tim. This great speed, uh, the new surface, what's that going to mean in the race? Is it going to be harder than years past or easier? Well, it'll probably be a little bit easier, Chris. Uh, the track's a little bit tackier and it makes it, the driving part it, a little easier. But uh, the thing we're going to have to watch out today is uh, we're going to have to take the track one step at a time to make sure it don't eat up the tires. Uh, once you start blistering tires, you're going backwards. And uh, we don't know because we haven't, this is our first race on the new surface. So. Uh, hopefully the tires will be all right, but we're, you've got to just take it one step at a time. Okay, you came off a win at Pocono. Does that give you a little edge today? Well, it doesn't hurt. It, it gave my banker a little edge, but uh, other than that, uh, you know, we're up front today, but we, we, we need to stay up front. Okay, hang in there. Thank you, Tim. Back to you, Ken. Let's talk about the favorites for just a moment. The press has pretty much picked Bill Elliott as the number one choice. Dale Earnhardt is the second. But you've been talking down there with the drivers as to who they think is going to be tough today. I talked with a number of the potential winners in this race, Ken, and Harry Gant's name came up among every one of them. They think he's the man to beat here today. And that's an incredible story. For just one week ago, Harry Gant had the worst crash of his career at Pocono, Pennsylvania. Three laps to go at Pocono. Buddy Arrington's car had spun. He came out perpendicular onto the track. It was collected first by the Morgan Shepherd car in a pretty hard crash. Bodine, he slipped through, and then Harry Gant in the Hal Needham Burt Reynolds car had absolutely no place to go. It crashed hard into the side of him. Here you see Gant being taken away. All three drivers are all right, but Gant is not just all right. He told me this morning he is sore in every muscle. He suffered a bruised part. He had one lung deflate. But he's back here, and the, the prediction is he's going to be the guy to beat. I think he will be. Well, we're almost down to it. Let's go to Mike Joy. This is the best Harry Gantz felt all day, sitting still, ready to go racing instead of walking around the garage area. Is this the sorest you've ever been, and how much will it affect your race today? Well, this is not the sorest I've ever been in a wreck or accident, uh, but I am real sore today. Uh, I don't think it'll affect it any uh, far as the performance of the car unless you know I would start to get weak or something and then it would definitely have to get out of the car well he's one of the big pre-race picks the cars on this circuit are tough the drivers are tougher the protocol for a start of event is a bit different here today there you see all the cars all the drivers in them and right now something a little different is going to happen here at the Michigan International Speedway let's go to the ladies the and gentlemen you are about to witness a historic moment in the world of sports as we break a precedent in preparing for the start of this year's Miller American 400. You will hear the command for one man and one man only to start his engine. 20 seconds later, the rest of the field will receive the command to fire their engines. We trust that while this lone engine comes to life, you will join us all 
and show your appreciation for the man known to all of us as King Richard. For this historic 1,000th start, and in honor of Father's Day, it is only fitting that the command be given by his daughters, Rebecca, Sharon, and Lisa. Daddy, start your engine! the starting lineup for the 18th annual Michigan 400 in row one at 172 miles per hour breaking Bill Elliott's old record by six and a half miles per hour Ashland Ohio's Tim Richmond and alongside the 1980 Michigan 400 winner Benny Parsons for row two coming back from the worst crash of his career just last Sunday in Pocono Pennsylvania Harry Gant and the 1986 Daytona 500 winner Jeff Bodine for row three it's the 71 and 81 Michigan 400 champion Bobby Allison and Morgan Shepard in row four Rusty Wallace from Missouri and the 1984 and defending champion at Michigan Bill Elliott in row five Terry Labonte from Texas Rick Wilson from Florida row six the number one stock car driver in the country Dale Earnhardt and Bobby Hillen Jr. of Midland Texas row seven is California's Joe Rutman and the 79 Michigan champion Buddy Baker row eight the 74 winner Richard Petty and Darrell Waltrip still seeking his first win in this race for row nine Jody Ridley from Georgia and Ricky Rudd of Virginia in row 10 it's Tommy Ellis and Neil Bonnet row 11 is Phil Parsons of Denver North Carolina and Pancho Carter of Brownsburg Indiana in row 12 Dave Marcus from Wisconsin and Missouri's Ken Schrader Row 13, Pittsburgh, Massachusetts, Ron Bouchard, and Ozona, Texas, Chet Phillips. Row 14, Spanaway, Washington's Derek Cope, and the six-time champion, Cale Yarborough. In row 15, Butch Miller from Michigan, the ASA star, and D.K. Ulrich. Row 16, it's Kyle Petty and Alan Kulwicki. Row 17, Jimmy Sauter and Eddie Beerswell of San Antonio, Texas. Row 18 is Mike Laws of Orlando, Florida, and Mike Waltrip from Kentucky. Row 19, the Trans Am star, Willie T. Ribs, and Bobby Wowak. For row 20, J.D. McDuffie and Gary Fedowa. Richard Petty's car number 43. There is one provisional starter that has entered the field, James Hilton will now start in the 41st position. You're now inside of Richard Petty's car number 43. And let's see if we can get a word with the king there on the throne of number 43. Richard, can you hear us? Yeah, you loud and clear. How about number 201 for this afternoon, sir? Well, I tell you, it couldn't be a better time to do it, that's for sure. All right. Were you surprised when the daughters were out there, Rebecca, Lisa, and all the gang? They, they did super. I'm, I'm very proud of Good luck to you today. Thank you. Well, I tell you, this is a, a, another moment in history for Richard Petty. Ken, it's, it's just hard to believe that a person could sustain what he has over the years and still be in here in good physical condition, ready to make his 1,000th start. Rebecca Leeson and Sharon Petty, you heard giving that command. There you see the number 43 car looking over the field. There's the provisional starter, number 48, James Hilton, starting 41st on the grid. And there was uh, some conversation about whether or not they would use that driver or another driver to start the car. We're coming down for the start. Tim Richmond on the point. 200 laps, 400 miles, and Richmond dives out in front. Petty goes up on the outside around Rutman. He pulls up on Earnhardt, and Petty begins to make a quick move. 
as they hit turn number one. It's Richmond out in front. Richard Petty closing all the time. He's moved in on Bobby Hillen as he comes out of 15th starting position. Ken, I think early in the race that we'll see most of them using a low groove, but as the race moves on, they'll test that higher groove. On the back straightaway, out in front, Tim Richmond is there and moving up Harry Gant quickly. Into turn three, first time. Gant's car seems to be working so well in the draft, however, he's about to be challenged. As they come around to complete one lap, Richmond first, Gant second, and on the inside, Bobby Allison, who's having a great year, back to third in points. Moves in on the inside. That's Bobby Allison. Tuck low. Jeff Bodine in the yellow car. Gant falling back. Falling back into fourth. Almost into fifth is Morgan Shepard in the yellow and white car. The Race Hill Farms entry. Makes its move. Lap two. Back straight away. Gant gets back in line. It looks like the outside groove is not the place to be right now. I would anticipate that before the day is over, we'll see them three and four wide for the lead on this track. It's the old track of a decade ago. Now here's Cale Yarborough, who qualified badly. They had the wrong gear, just didn't get it organized. Now they are in the Rainier Lundy car. Look at him charge. Six-time winner on this track. Benny Parsons has fallen from second to 11th in that first lap. Down to the inside. Stormy, the man who's won at Dover. And at Daytona, the yellow and white car. Bodine and Allison puts the move on the outside for second. From Jeff Bodine's car. Three in-car cameras today. You're riding with Jeff Bodine. You saw earlier Richard Petty. And you're also going to be riding today with the number one driver in the Winston Cup standings, Dale Earnhardt. And there is Dale Earnhardt fighting his way through traffic. No harder charger on the circuit than Dale Earnhardt. None. Up in front in points. And, of course, you'll pick up $150,000 with any kind of a finish today as we get down to the midway point of the season. Pack capacity house. Watching the field scream underneath Harold Kinder's flag stand. Into turn number one. Tim Richmond on a roll. Two seconds and then a win. And he'd like to make it another victory today. Is out in front. And Bobby Allison. The Stavola brothers, number 22, looks good. Here's Jeff Bodine moving to the inside on Allison. And you're riding with him as he makes the counterattack. Tries to move under Allison for second place. Both of those cars, Richmond's and Bodine's, are owned by businessman Rick Hendrick of Charlotte, North Carolina, who has become one of the most potent car owners in America. Up on the outside, the longtime veteran eases up through. Allison fighting there as you watch them come down out of the corner with Bodine. Very nifty move. He tried him on the inside, couldn't make it there, but he made the outside group work for him. A 25-car freight train for the lead here in Michigan. Tim Richmond has managed to stay out front while they battle for the other position. His car is very strong, Tim. Look at Gant battle back in car number 33. So sore, so hurt, he can hardly put his feet down. He walks carefully, methodically these days. He can get that right foot down, though, on the accelerator. He just leaves it there. Gant at number 33 on the charge. Around 169 and a half miles an hour the last lap. You're live here with CBS flag-to-flag -flag coverage of the Michigan 400. And look at this magnificent battle. That's 20 cars, all capable of winning this race at the end of 200 laps. I think everyone expected this kind of competition again after they repaved the track. The harsh winters here has taken its toll on the pavement the last few years, but now it's back to its form. One car already retiring. It's a former winner of the event. Benny Parsons has gone back behind the wall. Smoke coming out of car number 55. Parsons in early. Back straight away. Deployed in single file manner. Marching orders. Hold on for a while. Try him if you feel like it. Six laps complete this time by. But I thought he had a shot at the pole yesterday, but his car got a little loose in qualifying. He wants to prove now that he does have one of the fastest cars. Petty almost destroyed his car in qualifying. He went into the first turn at just about three miles an hour and too quick. There you are, back inside Petty's car as he rambles up through the field. He takes a very smooth line going into the turns and, of course, using the draft of the cars in front of him. Back with the leaders. Back straight away. Ned, you and I took a trip around this track, and the only place we found it bumpy was on the inside of four. It's as smooth as a baby's bottom everywhere else. It really is. It was surprising, especially the bank. Here's not quite as high, of course, as Daytona and Talladega, but still, that's a very difficult job to do the paving and to get it smooth. But whoever did this did a very fine job, and that resulted in the high speeds that we have seen. Bodine moves in on Tim Richmond, the leader. The number 25 car stays in front. 
Richmond has a great sense of humor after he qualified on the pole. He went to his press conference wearing a Bob Euchre mask. He walked into the press conference and said, where is the beer and the pizza? I've got a seat reserved in the front row. <laughs> he knew it would be a good one. That's a loss for work. He's got himself busy right now, though. His teammate, Jeff Bodine, he's working on him. Here comes Chet Phillip on the inside. A young, uh, he's a rookie in the field, doing a super job. Now you three, see th three wide racing. Bodine taking the lead. Bodine snaps down to the inside. Eats up Richmond. Goes into first. Gant closes in third. Allison in fourth. Six car lengths back. Working lap nine. The draft is very effective on this racetrack. Again, as we see Gant try to move up on the inside, but... The speeds they run here, and as wide as the turns are, they can use the draft to good advantage. Incredible live pictures here. CBS flag the flag coverage of the Michigan 400 on this Father's Day. Everybody looking at those watches, and the story here is probably how fast they're turning these laps. We'll check them for you. There you see Bodine out in front of that trio trying to get away from the field. Here is Mike Joy with the first retiree Parsons, of the event. I'm, I'm not supposed to be talking to you for another 396 miles. What happened? Something happened to the engine, Mike. I really don't know. When the third corner, something broke. Uh, what are you going to do? Well, in qualifying, he was on the pole for about two minutes, and that's about how long it lasted in the race. Tough luck. That is a hard one for Benny Parsons. Determined, another one of the great gentlemen of the sport. Here's Chris Economaki. Well, the clock show that Tim Richmond led the first few laps at just under 170 miles an hour. Now, keep in mind, tires have not been tested on this surface. There's deep concern here that this great speed is going to make for tire wear quicker than ever before. Back to you. Thank you, Chris. Coming down to complete 10 laps. Remember, those are very hard tires. They're running today. They're what they call the Rockingham tires. With 50 pounds of pressure on the right front, about 45 on the right rear, and 40 pounds on the left side of the car. And those 1199s are just about as tough as hockey pucks. They're very tough, no question about that. But when you consider they're going into these turns at about 185 to 190 miles an hour, that really puts a lot of stress on the tires. With 10 laps down, Bodine is now first. Richmond is second. Everybody's watching Harry Gant trying to close. Bobby Allison fourth. Bill Elliott fifth. Morgan Shepard sixth. Dale Earnhardt is in seventh. Terry Labonte is eighth. Baker is ninth. Bobby Hill in tenth. Rick Wilson in eleventh. Rusty Wallace is running in the twelfth position. We'll return with more live action from the Michigan 400 after this message and a word from your local station. With 11 of 200 laps complete, there you saw the standings in the last few moments as Bodine is in first place, Tim Richmond is in second, Harry Gant in third, Bobby Allison in fourth, Bill Elliott in fifth. And in the last few moments, Elliott has picked up a spot. He now lies fourth on the field. Here you are in turns one and two. He's showing the form that he used to win this race two years in a row, Ken, in 1984 and 1985. Notice that Harry Gant just isn't letting loose. He stays right where he wants to be, not putting any additional muscle on the car. Yesterday in the final quali or rather practice period, the Gant car turned some outstanding laps. I think that's the reason most of the drivers were using his name when you talked to them about who the favorite was in this race. It's because of the way his car was running, and he seemed to do it so effortless. The car was running anywhere he wanted it on the racetrack, and any driver will tell you, regardless of how long these straightaways are, that handling is still the key to getting around here. A tremendous congregation of folks here this afternoon watching this great battle in the Michigan 400. $476,000 at stake. The entire 41-car field separated by one and seven-tenths seconds before the start of the event. We're down on pit road, and now it's two and two-tenths seconds covering the top seven. There you are with Harry Gantz, number 33. Richmond's car is still using a very good line, and he uses to good effect drafting right up on the back bumper of Jeff Bodine as he come off the turn. The 38 car is going to come on pit road for the moment. Mike Laws of Orlando, Florida. Now he could race till the year 2020 give you a little perspective on Petty's mark. You have to make every single race to catch up with where Richard is. Wouldn't that be something? I don't think we'll ever see this record broken. And Richard has shown absolutely no inclination to throw in the towel. You're inside of his towel, inside of his car, and you know he's holding his towel right now. <laughs> That's a uh, clock line as he keeps it with him all the time. Now, that's always been a... There's Rusty Wallace's 
car number 27, and Wallace is slowing down. Wallace already has one victory this season. Rusty Wallace, who I thought would do very well here today. He thought he would, too, and his car was handling very well, but evidently there's some mechanical problem with it. He was running 12th when the car went away. 17 laps complete. Rusty Wallace eases onto pit road. Richard Petty has got himself into a draft with Dave Marcus in the 71 as they try to move up. They are outside of the top 15 at the present time. There's Richard fighting his way around this track. Interesting camera that gives you the perspective of what the driver is doing in car number 43, and that's what he's looking up for. And we say uh, goodbye to the Laws car out of Orlando, Florida. Back to the leaders. And a caution is caution is coming down. Yellow is on the track. Word is that Rusty Wallace had brushed the wall off turn two, and that's the reason for his unscheduled pit stop. He gets service the right side tires, but he gets back out and he goes a lap down as the leaders come by. This is happening at lap 18. First caution of the day at lap 18. Now we had a race that was caution free back in 1973 when they set the mark for this event. David Pearson at 153.4 miles per hour for this June race. And may maybe we can see what happened out here that brought out this caution. Let's go to the videotape. Boy, it, it looked like that a tire went down or something, Ken. He just shot up to that wall. He didn't hit it very hard. There was not a great deal of sheet metal damage to the right side of the car, but it, I believe that he had a tire go down that caused him to go into the wall. Well, we stood down here in turn number one and watched people yesterday, and it seemed like the perspective on the corner was different. I mean, when Richard Petty throws a car away by some, uh, oh, 15 feet sideways, you know that something's a lot different than what it's been before. We'll be back with more in a moment. Richard Petty's done everything you can do in this business. Uh, most wins, and I think he said it too, most losses, but most starts. And uh, a thousand starts, just to put it in perspective, I've started 300 odd races. So if I was to try to make a thousand starts, I'd be roughly 60 odd years old. So uh, I don't think I can do it. What? 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 What for a second? Under caution, the entire field is pitted. 20 laps are complete. With Ned Jarrett, I'm Ken Squire, and the story is on pit road with Chris Economaki and Mike Joy for the moment. Jake Elder, one of the best chassis men in the business right now, talking on the two-way headset to his driver, Morgan Shepard. Shepard, like Harry Gant, was injured last week at Pocono, but feels okay to go the distance. You were ready to put tires on the car, but Morgan waved you off. Uh, he said he didn't want no tires right now. Now, usually on the first pit stop, they'll take the tires off and look at them, see how they're working, and put a fresh set on. But Morgan apparently must be real happy with what's on that car. This is not the car they wanted to run here. It's a narrower car built for the higher speed tracks at Daytona and Talladega, but Shepard says it works just fine with a new paving here at Michigan. Let's go to Chris Economaki. This is the right rear tire off of leader Jeff Bodine's car. The lap before he stopped, he turned it over 170 miles an hour. The tread temperature is 225 degrees, and that's good. 235 is okay. 270, they blister, and at 290, they come apart. So right now, the tire news is good. Back to you, Ken. Thank you, Chris. Let's take a look at the attrition. Those now out of the race. Benny Parsons is out, and the young man from Florida, Laws, he has retired his car, and both engine problems. Rusty Wallace came in. They had the hood up briefly on his machine. Mike Waltrip led a lap. The number 23 car stayed out. The Dick Bear car now continues on its way. And as we sort it out for a start, field coming down in turn number three, we'll see the heavy hitters because everyone took the opportunity to pit at lap 18 net. And most of them did change tires. Uh, as Mike Joy pointed out, they will take a look at those tires and perhaps even put them back on later on. But this is the longest run they've had under Green since they have been here. Several drivers ran 12, 15 laps yesterday testing the tires out, but they didn't get an opportunity to run as many as 20. So this is a good test for them. The first 10 laps will run at an average speed of 162.1 miles per hour. And we are back under Green another time as they get ready to sort it out. J.D. McDuffie in car number 70 leads them into turn number one. Morgan Shepard deployed directly behind him. Now comes to the inside, and there you see the yellow and white car. Of Morgan Shepard trying to get through, and J.D. moved down to hold the line. Yes, he did. He's going to stay right out there. This must be a thrill for him. One of the longtime independents in the sport. Doesn't get to run up front much, but he's going to use this opportunity right now to do it. Builds his own engines, builds his own cars, and here he is fighting off the Wolf Pack, going down into turn number three. Shepard sizes him up. 
Stafford. Look at him three wide with Earnhardt right in the middle, just behind. Richmond moving up through. Now to the inside. Morgan Shepard, former national sportsman champion. J.D. McDuffie goes back one spot, and he'll slide back some more. He just gets out horsepowered and out money here. Money by speed, no question about it. His mo biggest moment of glory, Ken, he won a pole at Dover, Delaware, back in 1978. And did it on McCrary Tires. Yes, he did. Now here's Earnhardt closing in, getting inside Dale Earnhardt's car. Number one in points, three victories this year. He's going to be tough to beat for the championship. You always wait for the Junior Johnson onslaught after the 4th of July, but the Richard Childers team seems to be wired this year. They look tough in that blue and yellow number three. There's the leader, Morgan Shepard. And closing up on the inside, right behind him, there's a battle for second place. There you see it. Down they come for turn four. They haven't stacked them two and three deep yet, but I'm sure they will. Earnhardt taking over in second. Terry Labonte, that's the white hooded blue car, now running in third and right behind him. Comes Richmond, then Gant, back in fifth, followed by Bodine, who's fallen three spots in the last lap. And Kim, the set of tires that Tim Richmond has now doesn't seem to be working quite as well as the ones he had on earlier because he's not able to keep his car quite as low on the racetrack. On the shoot and scoot, number nine, Bill Elliott goes by Richard Petty as they fight further back in the field. Petty running back in 18th position. 1,000 start. He just as soon let him soar out and to stay in that lead lap. Dale Inman did a tremendous amount of work on engines getting ready for this 1,000th performance. They had a special party for him in Jackson, Michigan last night. And everybody was there. And Earnhardt now has taken the lead from Morgan Shepard. Wants to lead the race at least a lap, Ken, because he gets five bonus points for leading, and that would add to his total. Morgan Shepard stays with him. Down into turn number three on the inside. There you see Labonte trying to make his move. Richmond comes down low. In fourth, the green car on the outside. Now pulling into fourth and trying for third is Harry Gant. But it's Dale Earnhardt out in front. Look at him swap lines out there. You can do it here. Now they go three wide, just behind in third spot. Look at this battle for third. With Richmond on the inside, Labonte and Gant pressed up against the wall. He had help that time. His teammate Jeff Bodine came up behind him. They picked the draft up together and shot right on past him. Whoa. Morgan slides it across, slithers across the rake track. Dirt track style, which he's plenty used to. Dale Earnhardt trying to move inside of him. Back straight away. Back to over 185 miles an hour here. Live on CBS, the Michigan 400 with Morgan Shepard out in front. He's won a grand uh, Winston Cup race this year. He's Boy, not going to be Earnhardt there long. Look, here comes Earnhardt. And here comes Richmond. They may stack him three wide for the lead. Three wide well, down four. the line. How oh, you come back in low. Tim Richmond drops it on the bottom, and Bodine stayed with him right down in the apron, cutting grass as he came across the start-finish line. He is an exciting driver. <laughs> For everybody Earnhardt is car owner. I think that would scare him to tears. <laughs> Earnhardt didn't like that. Here he comes. Yeah. That's the one guy you don't want to get angry at, Earnhardt. He said to me the other day, he said, I know I can get up. I know I don't, I don't know if I can get by the guy, but I know I can get to his bumper. <laughs> Here's Earnhardt out in front. Richmond in second. Bodine in third. Gant in fourth. Morgan Shepard back to fifth. Back to the line. Down to the inside. Move for the lead. Give it to Richmond going into turn one. Tim Richmond of Ashland, Ohio. Back in front. A report in the pits from Chris Economacki. Well, we just talked to Jeff Bodine's crew chief, Gary Nelson, and asked him what he said, and he says he's not saying anything. Well, if you're watching what he's doing, you can understand why he's not talking now. Back to you, Ken. Here. Number six, D.K. Allred coming off the pace, and the field thunders by. You're going about 50 or 60 miles an hour. I gave you some perspective of the speed at which they turn this great two-mile track in the Irish Hills of Michigan. Ken, I'm sure to the fans, they wonder how... I mean, they get past one lap, then they're able to pass the same car back the next lap. They do it by getting behind them, picking up the draft, building up the momentum, and then just shoot right past them, as we see Richmond try to do, but Earnhardt cuts him off. Like riders shuffling on a subway to get out of the door. Here they are. They're trying to get out in front right here, and for the moment, and only a moment, down the back straightaway, 
Well, he's going to hold on for a second. I thought Earnhardt was going to get, but now comes Richmond. He tried to break the draft on him, but it didn't work. Well, I guess it did work. He's still out front. Look at this. First to 12th. That's one and six ten seconds, Ned. Unbelievable racing, but what we expected with this new paper. Field coming by. Bodine closing up in that third spot. Here comes Richmond again. I do believe they are having a wonderful afternoon. No question about it. They're having fun. It's hard work, but it's also fun. I mentioned earlier that it didn't look like Richmond's tires were working as well. Now that they've seated in, they are working well. Fresh track. You want a track to cure. Hope you always hope for warm days. Let the oil come up out of the track and some rain. And they've had that. Looking back off the backside here and closing up off Earnhardt's car. There is Tim Richmond. Sticks their nose right up on the back <laughs> bumper. Now, those are a couple of guys that they don't mind swapping cheap metal, those two particularly. No, they have fun at it. Yep. They're friends, but they're fierce competitors when they get on the racetrack. One of the things about what has happened with Earnhardt this year, particularly, I, I think he has absolutely done what he's tried to create over two or three years. They are giving him room when he wants it. They gave him room, no question about it. Waltrip, Allison, Yarborough. You see them running there in tandem. That is seventh, eighth, and ninth position. Kale started in the 28th position, yeah. so he has really moved up. Not, of course, some of that could have come on the pit stop, but he also has been moving up through the field. Watt well, Wilson prepared car for Harry Rainier, sandwich back, there, and he is on the cuff. Kale's going to be a factor before this is over, no doubt about it. He's in that lead pack. And look at Earnhardt just show the muscle of the Richard Childress car. Now by 10 car lengths, car number three out in front. It is the surprising that he's been able to pull away and get any kind of a lead because of the draft that's working. Ken, I've noticed that they're starting to move up on the turns a little bit, so that second and third group is beginning to work. And then maybe it's getting a little slippery on the bottom now. They all thundered in there so hard, working the bottom of the racetrack. They may need an extra groove or two now. Well, that lead, big lead didn't last too long. They drafted right past him, right back up on him, I should say. Yeah, so nine, the man coming up, 42.9. That's over the record, 167.83 for an individual lap. That's just a second slower than Richmond qualified. He was 42, 41.85 seconds. Here comes Gant trying the inside. Gant trying to move down low on Bodine. There's the leader, Earnhardt. And then right behind them, there you see Bodine. He's going to make a move for the lead. Jeff Bodine going into turn number three on the bottom of the racetrack. Wheel to wheel into turn three. Bodine, no Earnhardt back in front. Bodine had to back off a little bit. Apparently his car started to slip just enough, and he had to back off, and that gave Earnhardt the lead once again. Earnhardt out in front, and here comes Gant on the inside of Bodine from Dale Earnhardt's car. That's the view. Gant of the green car on the inside, the familiar number five of Rick Hendrick Racing Stable on the outside. Line them up and marshal their forces down there like a Marine Corps on parade. And here they are through four, uh, through one and two again. Let's go to Mike Joy. Well, Cale Yarbrough has really climbed the ladder. He started 28th and he just moved into eighth spot. Waddell, Wilson, you folks must really have hit the right setup for the start of this race. Well, you know, we qualified bad naturally and we changed the car around entirely after qualifying. And, you know, we had trouble qualifying because we would and just guessed on the setup and then yesterday afternoon we finally got the car straight out and now it's running well but you know they've repaved the track here in Michigan and if they're racing now like they did back in 1969 it's anybody's race from here on it's fun to watch to see them go three wide around here well you know you normally don't see things like this any place maybe Talladega but here at Michigan you know it's back like it used to be and they're enjoying their driver as Kale brings that car toward the front Bobby Bobby Allison just went by Kale Yarbrough he went back to seventh Kale fell to eighth and you can see Kale's number 20 he seemed to waver a little up turn number four back with the leaders for a moment and we're with Jeff Bodine car number five out in front then Earnhardt is in that second spot. Harry Gant maintains the third. Tim Richmond is in fourth. Terry Labonte in fifth. Morgan Shepard in sixth. Allison seventh. Kale is eighth. Waltrip ninth. Buddy Baker tenth coming by us. Then it's Ricky Rudd eleventh. Bill Elliott in twelfth. Richard Petty back there in fourteenth. Tim Richmond has found himself something coming off a of turn four. He, he picked up the draft of Earnhardt and Gant running side by side. Shot all the way down to the inside. Went by both of them up into second place. 
There's the number five car of Bodine. And momentarily, we've, we've lost our pictures out of uh, Bodine's car. Here's that second place car. Tim Richmond is there again as they see saw back and forth. And it's relatively new names from what we've known over the past years here at Michigan that dominate the front five. There's been 10 different winners so far on the circuit this year. This fantastic competition. Look at Bodine take them in way high as they begin to use up more racetrack. And we'll have more of the exciting live action on CBS of the Michigan 400 in a moment. We're celebrating uh, the fact that it is his thousandth race. That's a, well, to live that long something and then to be able to win like he does and still be competitive, I think that's a tribute to, to a great man. The streets of Motown will come alive with the sounds of Formula One thunder for the Detroit Grand Prix next Sunday on CBS Sports. continues to maintain the lead here at the Michigan International Speedway. Richard Petty on lap 39, just about a minute ago, made an unscheduled stop. Came in, spent 11 and 7 10 seconds on pit road. Now there are the standings at the present time. Bodine is in first, Earnhardt in second, then Tim Richmond is maintaining third, Terry Labonte is in fourth, Morgan Shepard runs a stout fifth. Of course, that was at 40 laps, and just a lap ago, Harry Gant went by all of those cars, came from sixth up to second, and now he has caught Jeff Bodine. Let's see if he can deal with him here. Bodine first, the number 33 car, Gant in second. Now you're back with Jeff Bodine, camera from inside of his car working once again. And here's Harry Gant trying the outside a little out of turn number three into four around the outside as they come down the wall in front of the grandstand. Now, earlier, he couldn't make that groove work for him, Ken, but it is working now. Harry Gant out in front. Earnhardt has led every race this year but Riverside, California. And he stays right up in the midst of this thing. Earnhardt back in third. That pit stop by Richard Petty was for a change of right side tires. He remains on the lead lap. He's running about 10, sec or, yes, about 10 seconds ahead of the leaders at the moment on the lead lap. 42 laps are complete. The lead is now Gant. Bodine second, Earnhardt third. Bobby Allison is pulled into fourth. This track has some beautifully wide, sweeping corners. This monopenny design worked so well. With a new paving. On the pit road comes number 11, Waltrip. Darrell Waltrip, who has never won this Michigan 400. Trying to turn that around today. It looks like it'll be a change of right side tires for him. But Chris Economac, he pointed out at the top of the show that the tires might not go as long as the gas, and evidently we're seeing some of that. That was uh, the indication on Petty's car. And you can see that there is a blister tire. You can just see a piece of it there. One of our pit reporters will get a closer look at that a little later. And you can feel that in a race car. That's like having oh, yeah. a vibrator on your back. No question about it. Not a very pleasant one either. That number 33, as he came out, he had to make just a tiny correction to bring it down through. The green car of Harry Gant. The only time he feels good this week, remember he bruised his heart, had a lung go down, he crashed into a car at 170 miles an hour, a little less than that, about 130 up there, turn one at, uh, at uh, Pocono. Yeah, they're moving pretty swift when they go into yeah. that turn at Pocono. And the only time he feels good is when he's sitting in a car and the temperature gets up to about 100 or 110 degrees inside. Hello there. And I've said many times when I was racing, and I've talked to drivers since then, that the race car can be some of the best medicine that a race driver can get. Well, Never. Ned, you had an incident where you had a terrible gash. And you and you literally healed in a matter of two hours of the race, right? In a, in, a, in a total of 38 hours from the time it was stitched. They put five stitches in it. And I pulled the stitches out. It was completely healed. Here's Chris. Uh, okay, well, the problems have started to surface with the tires. Richard Petty just made a stop and took off these blistered tires here. The temperatures on Petty's car were too high, and as you can see, they're right through the tread and down to the canvas. So, for some teams, they're going to have tire trouble. Now down pit road to Mike Joy. Terry Labonte has just been on in and out of pit road. Chris, with the exact same problem. Here is the tire that just came off Labonte's car, off the right rear, and it is right down to the cord. The tire engineers are going to have a look at this, and I think everybody is going to have to rethink their chassis setup for the rest of this race. Whoa, that could be real problems before this day is over. Ken, it was a hit or miss situation as far as Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company is concerned. The pavement was put down just recently. Here's Ricky Rudd coming in for a pit stop. They didn't have time 
to do the proper testing that they need. So they assumed that the tires they used at Rockingham, North Carolina, earlier in the spring with brand new pavement there, that it might would work here on the new pavement. The speeds are higher here, much higher than anyone expected, and certainly is taking its toll here now. Willie T. Ribs, who got a start. We see Ricky Rush coming out. Willie T. who started 37th, now up to 26th. The sixth black driver in the history of NASCAR stock car racing. Won a lot of Trans Am races, trying to get his luck turned around. Not had much of it in these big stock cars today. Now you see Gant closing on Petty. He went to Petty a lap down. Here's Bobby Allison in the pits. And if Harry Gant moves around Richard Petty, that would put Petty a lap down after his unscheduled pit stop. And there's Gant making the move to put Petty one lap down. Makes it tougher to win that 201, Ken, when you're a lap down, especially the way Gant's running. But I'll tell you, this is a long race, and with the problems we see developing here, anything can happen. What we, what we need to see here is Allison comes out, and caution is on the track. Now, if Petty could pull back up on Gant, I don't believe he can. It'd be a big break for him. If he can pass him before he gets back to the start-finish line, which he's not going to no be way. able to do, he will stay a lap down. Too bad just a lap ago, if he could have stayed out there, he would got to go all the way around and made up that lap. Bodine in second, Morgan Shepard in third as they cross the line. Caution is out on the track, trying to get an indication as to the why. Morgan Shepard fourth, Tim Richmond in fifth. There's Richard's car. I would guess, Ken, that there might be some debris on the racetrack somewhere, and it could be off of some of the tires. Average speed through 30 laps. We're up to 48 now. is 147. We had that early caution. We're in the second caution of the day. Petty will start from inside of the front row. Lap cars on the bottom. Gant will be on the outside, and in pursuit of him will come car number five, perched on his rear bumper, Jeff Bodine. But everybody will be coming into the pits when they come off of turn four, because they'll... Those that haven't had to make the unscheduled stops will certainly welcome this opportunity to come in and change those tires. Let's see. The 33 comes in and the 43 comes in. I thought Petty might try to stay out there. No, he needs to put left side tires on the car as well, Ken, and he also might need to make a chassis adjustment. However, I think one of the crew members... Here's Mike Joy. Harry Gant is in, and he has the same problem. Now, we'll look to see if they make a chassis adjustment on Gant's car for one of the mechanics reaching in to adjust the weight on the rear. They're not going to do that, but they have put new tires on the right side of the car, and the right rear on Gant's car is not blistered. Let's go to Chris. Okay, Dale Earnhardt is in the pits, and they're not taking any chances here. They're changing both sides. The right side has been changed. The left side is gone. Now we're going to take a look at the tires. They make no chassis adjustments. And from what we can see, uh, it looks okay. Let's look at back down pit road to Mike Joy. In the Bill Elliott pit, Elliott's Ford is on and off pit road, and the tires don't look bad. It just came off of his Harry Melling Ford Thunderbird. They're a little grainy, and that means the tire is wearing much like a pencil eraser. That right rear tire is lifted over the wall. But they are not blistered like on Ricky Rudd or Darrell Waltrip, and neither of them. Back upstairs. Ken, it has a great deal to do with the way the chassis is set up on the car. We'll have see a lot of them that won't have tire problems today because your chassis is right. Richard Petty chewing on the towel at lap 49, getting up toward lap number 50. Even though that towel's a little ragged at the bottom edge, I'm sure he hasn't used it in all 1,000 of those races. <laughs> Richard Petty came out just behind the Gann car and the Earnhardt car as they came back on the track, so he stays a lap down. There's Bobby Allison back in as they continue to work on that car. You know, sometimes they hit it, and sometimes they don't. It's as simple as it gets. Those combinations make the tires either work or not work. Here's Mike. Here's the right rear tire that just came off Harry Gant's car. You can see this tire is worn, but it's not blistered. Got a little scuff mark on it here where Harry slid to a stop in the pits. But it does not look like the tire that came off Walter Murrug's car. When they set up the handling on these cars, they jack a certain amount of weight onto each corner. And perhaps Earnhardt, Waltrip, and Rudd had too much weight shifted to the right rear of that car, so the right rear tire has to work harder and burn that tire up. Dale Inman, the crew chief on Richard Petty's car, tells us that we can converse with him for a moment here under caution. Richard Petty, Kent Squire in the CBS booth. How's it going out there today? Having a mechanical problem. He's a lap down. Things are a 
problem for Richard Petty's car number 43 with the with our audio. Apologies, Richard. Hopefully we can get a word of you a little later. Of course, he went the lap down with the unscheduled pit stop. We'll have to wait from uh, word from scoring as to whether Allison and Waltrip lost a lap during their pit stop. I don't think they did. As those cars were deployed around the track, it was interesting. Gant had drawn away from everyone by a remarkable distance. He had two and a half, three seconds. I mean, he had the back stretch, except for Bodine. Bodine stayed within, what, uh, 200 feet of him. But he was drawing away from everyone. Yes, he was. Apparently, the drivers that we talked to yesterday in a little private poll knew what they were talking about when, when they said Gant was the man to beat here today. Neil Bonney got out of the pits first of those that made pit stops, so that sees him at the head of the pack with Gant right on his bumper there. Getting ready for a start. When they come by this time, they'll go back under green. That'll be lap 52. Let's go to Chris. Okay, the importance of tires as to the channeling of a car's chassis is unbelievably significant. Here they, the stagger, the diameter on this tire is 89 and a quarter inches. Over here, it's 89 and 7 eighths. Now, when the sun went behind the cloud, they remeasured the tires, and the tires were one eighth of an inch smaller. Now the sun is back out again, and the tires will glow a little bit. All of that has a bearing on how a car works on the racetrack. So these tires may be the key to victory today. Now down pit road to Mike Joy. Well, Chris, I'm in Morgan Shepard's pit, and we're looking at the right rear tire that came off of Morgan Shepard's car. There is one blister on there. We'll have video back for you in a moment, but otherwise that tire looks pretty good. Remember, on the first caution, Shepard did not change tires. He took on gasoline only. That got him to the front of the pack on the restart, and he ran at the front of the pack for quite some time. Back upstairs. Getting set for a start. And that will be at least another lap. As you see the lights on in a pace car, they, they, they are, they're going to send them around at least another time before they turn them loose. So we'll pause for these messages and then be back with more of our live CBS coverage of the Michigan 400. So I was fortunate enough, the first race I ever won in a sport, I beat Richard Petty at Richmond, Virginia. And I looked in the mirror, and he was right behind me all the time, and I didn't have to have anybody in that pit to tell me, hey, Richard's on your tail. When I saw that little red and blue race car, it's just kind of a, feels like a bear back there gripping at you. You know, just the mystique, the, uh, the power of the Richard Petty symbol that's been there for so many years. You, when you see that car coming, you give it a lot of respect. We've had two laps under green, about to be three. And jumping out in front was Neil Bonnet. Then pouncing on him was that number 33. Harry Gant has taken the lead. Pulling up into second has been Earnhardt, but the man that everyone's watching now is Cale Yarborough, who is into the fourth position. Let's take a look at the top 10 after 100 miles. After 100 miles, 50 laps of competition. Alan Kowicki, the uh, rookie driver, was up front at that time. That was because of the pit stops. And for a moment, he had a little a little bit of glory. Rookie driver. And then Gant, followed by Allison, Neil Bonnet. I don't think Harry was in two positions at once. Dale Earnhardt, Rick, uh, Ricky Wilson, and Kaylee Yarbrough, followed by Bobby Hillen and Tim Richmond. And the car that was up front at 100 miles, Alan Kowicki, has just made an unscheduled pit stop. Again. He's back out on the track now. See Gant going around him as they go into turn one. That came right in a period of caution, so there were some in and some out among the leaders. Again, they've changed engine men on the Needham car. They just don't think they're getting, a, they didn't think they were getting the horsepower. They sure have it today. Look at him draw out in front. There's an interval for you, and he's developed that in just a few laps. And notice Kelly Arborough, the orange and white car, closing up on Earnhardt. There's the sleeper here right now. Yarborough is very victory hungry, no doubt about that. He won two races last year in the Ford after the Rainier Lundy team switched to the Ford products and went for a while without victory, but towards the end of the season, they were able to pull off two. If you're just joining us, we are here at the Michigan International Speedway, the site of Richard Petty's 1,000 start, an incredibly fast lap speed being generated every time around this two-mile D-shaped oval as they have repaved the track, and we've got old-fashioned real racing here. Gant now has a one-second lead, and as to that Cale Yarborough, here he comes charging. You see him sandwiched in between Earnhardt and Richmond. As to what's going on with car 28, I think Mike Joy can update us. A whole lot of 
cars on the racetrack. Waddell Wilson has chosen the pit position closest to turn number four at the head end of pit road. So on the caution flags, Kale already has his service completed before Jeff Bodine, Earnhardt, Waltrip, some of the cars at the far end of pit road have even come to a stop. So Kale has the whole length of pit road to build up speed and get one of those front spots behind the caution car. He's moving up a lot in the order just that way. Second place scramble going on. Ken, the fans might wonder, well, how did they get to choose that pit? The champion of the division gets to choose his pit first. That's Darrell Walker, and then everybody else goes according to the way that they qualify, and those uh, that qualified up front, Yarbrough was in 28th place. It was just something that was left. And they give it a lot of consideration. They do. I was with Bernhardt yesterday when they came through, and they stood around, he and Childress, and speculated on what was going to be the most advantageous position to be in on pit road for this 400 mile test. There you see Gant trying to draw away and having no luck at all. The three car freight train has collected car number 33 Gant. They're running him down. Remember he had a one second advantage. You can say goodnight to that one. Here comes Earnhardt on the charge with Kale, with Richmond and out back in that little grouping Morgan Shepard. Ken, there have been some races this year, the high-speed racetracks, as they move up on Gant, and it looks like Earnhardt's going to move right around him. Right down to the bottom, at turn one, Earnhardt. That snazzy-looking yellow and blue number three takes the lead. Look at Morgan Shepard getting a bite on the bottom. He pulls up, sneaks in between the Gant car, the Arboro car, as they come out of turn two. What I was about to say, in some of the races this year, after they put the rear sloped windows on the GM cars, they were saying that the draft was not as effective as it had been sometime in the past, but it is certainly working here today. I would point out, too, from that shot you just saw going down the back straightaway, that that wall is very deceptive. It jumps out about 14 inches after you start down the back straight, and you want to think about it, because if you come out and you set the car to come out to the off the corner, off the apex, it'll take the right side of your car clean off. You know, that's the point that Dick Beatty, the competition director of NASCAR, brought out in the driver's meeting this morning. He, he reminded the drivers of that situation. Look at them shuffle, and look at Morgan, the shepherd shuffle, as he slides it from the bottom to the top. Getting a lap time recorded for you. Richmond ducks down low, and Morgan keeps on trucking. Pulls up on Earnhardt. I love to watch Morgan Shepard race. He's a racer. Oh, uh, well, you put him on a half mile, quarter mile. He's He is just magic. One earlier this year in Atlanta, very fine style, and everybody didn't fall out. He played beat him. Now, look at this. This speed development as they came off the fourth, and they all used the same line to stay right in there. Next week here on CBS, live flag the flag coverage of the United States Grand Prix around the Renaissance Center in Detroit. Bulletin, Nigel Mansell wins Canadian Grand Prix. Nigel Mansell, Team Williams, comes to Detroit next week. You'll see it on CBS. Well, a left half there by Gant on Morgan Shepard. They've raced against each other on the uh -huh. short tracks around Hickory, North Carolina, and Charlotte in the past. Hi, Morgan. How you doing? Fine. I'll see you a little later. And he drives away from him. <laughs> a true enthusiast. Bernard has built a lot of fans this year. NASCAR's Grand National Circuit, known formerly as the Sportsman Group, they were at Rougemont Speedway last night. Tommy Houston came out on top. Some new kid named Jarrett came home second. Dale Jarrett. He's trying hard, Ken. He'll win. He'll oh, win he in South Boston. <laughs> Two weeks. <laughs> Let's hope. That group goes to Indianapolis, Indiana next Saturday. Shepard is keeping the pressure on, waiting for his chance. And Kale is taking a different route. Kale Yarbrough going low. No one knows this track like Yarbrough. He has an incredible record. Ooh, Ooh boy, they bump. Up again. He bumps again. How uh, do you do? That was a little more than a left hand. Yeah. That was a whole lot of, let me tell you, I'm there. Don't mess with my line. Kale has won here six times. In the last 10 years, he has completed 99.9 .9 laps of the race's run. Only one lap has he missed. Now he's a remarkable individual. He, he's one of the hardest chargers of all. Now he's going to try Earnhardt. Great book just out by William Neely about Kale Yarbrough. A lot of fun. 
we're going to get a chance to look and replay at Morgan Shepard and Kale and their little Father's Day greeting to each other. Here's Kale moving in, Ooh. almost into the wall, almost into the side of the Dale Earnhardt car, and almost into the wall as they collect each other right there coming out of four. Down through the D-shape, into turn one, side by side. And the well, Rainier car is going down in front. Kale Yarborough is pushing the nose of number 28 as he goes for his seventh win here. Let's look and replay at what happened. Let's look and replay. Yarborough down on the inside. He slips up into Shepard just a little bit. Then they bounce apart. Shepard sort of cuts back down on him there. He didn't like that lick. But here they come again. Kale coming up high on the racetrack and Shepard not getting room. Willie T. Ribs is crashing. Willie T. Ribs spinning. And down to the bottom of the racetrack. Good Caution out by Tommy Ellis as he moved on the inside of Willie T as he was spinning around to the inside of the racetrack. We, ha we have an indication that Shepard is being warned for sideswiping Kale in that incident we were showing you. Cut that out. Willie T climbing out of car number 30. That's a tough break. Willie, is, this is, uh, what, his third race on the NASCAR Grand National Circuit. He's going to raise the hood and see what's wrong under there. Yeah, it looks like an engine caved in. Yeah. Okay, we have a, we'll have a chance to look at Willie T. Ribs spin in a moment. Let's go back again to see what developed between Morgan Shepard and Kelly Yarborough. Okay, that uh, looks like a clean pass to that point. Yarborough got pretty close. Now he goes up against him and... Uh, certainly Shepard didn't give him uh, any more running room than he needed, but Shepard kept a pretty straight line there at that point. Certainly did. Yeah. Now let's look at what happened at Willie T. Ribs. He is out of the car. Evidently the engine let go as he went into the turn. You see the smoke coming from it. Got under the rear wheels and around he went. He does a good job, Ken, of holding the car down on the inside of the racetrack. Makes a complete 360 around again. Car's going by on the outside. And he goes around again. And there's, uh, I think that's the Tommy Ellis car going down on the inside. Well, it's not the Tommy Ellis car. It's Jim Sauter from Nacito, Wisconsin going down. Good move by him. Kelly Arbro, car number 25, is pulling on pit road. We asked him about racing here at the Michigan International Speedway. Yeah, I enjoy running here. It's a racetrack that's uh, it's wide, it's got a lot of room, and you can do a lot of racing here, and I enjoy racing, so uh, it's a racetrack I think suited for me. We've uh, we've always run well here, and uh, won some races here, so I just hope we can do it again. He's doing it really well right now. All the leaders have taken the opportunity to pit. They're back on the track. There's Willie T. Ribs as the wrecker comes out to collect car number 30. One of the fellows that Jim Truman helped so much, Willie T. Ribs, in his Trans Am experience, giving him some help in this Grand National program as well. So we're under caution. We're showing 67 laps complete. And we will return with more live action from the Michigan 400 after this word from your local station. This CBS Sports Special, the Michigan 400, is sponsored by Mr. Goodwrench. No one knows your GM car better than Mr. Goodwrench. No one. Ace Hardware Corporation. And by Mobile One Synthetic Motor Oil. Mobile One protects your engine better than any conventional motor oil. The beautiful countryside around Brooklyn, Michigan puts us in mind of where we spent last weekend enjoying the International Race of Champions at Jim Truman's beautiful Mid-Ohio course. Jim Truman passed away this past week, uh, a man who, to many of us, personally defined the idea of faith moving mountains. From one motel in 1972, he built his chain to some 155 successful motels in 30 states. And he dearly loved motorsports, not only as a patron, but as a participant. He's won some 100 events himself, the Can-Am title, two national titles, and he turned Mid-Ohio into the garden spot, the nation's benchmark for quality road racing facilities. But his faith and belief in one young man from Dublin, Ohio, became his greatest sports moment when Bobby Ray Hall won Indianapolis for them two weeks ago. A very special man with special people that surrounded him 
totally dedicated to motorsports. He added a perception of motorsports that uh, a lot of America hadn't understood before. He'll be sorely missed, and to his wife Barbara and his children Michelle, Colin, who's a pretty good little young racer, and Megan, uh, all of us at CBS have our condolences and support as they carry on in the work and joy of Jim Truman. Mike Joy is standing by with Harry Hyde. Harry and Tommy Johnson are talking tires. That's what everybody's talking about here on Pit Road. Harry Goodyear recommended that you scuff in the tires before you put them on the race car. But the set of right side tires that just went on that car were brand new sticker tires. Why make that change? You mean on our car? Oh, I bet you they're not sticker tires. Okay. They better not be. Then I'll stand corrected. If you scuff them in, what advantage does that those give have, you? Those have four laps on them, and uh, we scuffed all of our tires except one set. And uh, we're in pretty good shape on tires. We haven't had any failures yet up to 30 laps. I think Harry knows more than he's telling here. You're the an old curmudgeon type of crew chief. There's a bunch of those around here. You've got a young playboy driver. Does that work? Oh, yeah. we got a happy medium there. He gives a little bit, and I give a little bit. <laughs> and uh, uh, he, if, if I tell him to smooth it out, he'll do it. He'll do what I tell him. And uh, today, we're running real good. We're running right where we want to be. And uh, he's looking real good. Uh, the old and the new is making it real good right now. Well, last week they gave it heck all the way to victory lane. Let's go to Chris. I'm with Travis Carter, Harry Gans crew chief. Travis, Harry is on his 13th, 14th, 15th, and 16th tires of the race. Only 130 some miles gone by. Will you have enough to go the full distance? Well, I think so. Most of these tires uh, look like today they're going to be reusable. I looked down the road and a couple of guys had a little problem, but we didn't have any tire problem. I think that track had changed a little bit and maybe the staggers were a little off and he felt that he might be uh, getting into position to have some trouble so he just eased off then. I, I think we're going to be all right. The tires are reusable. I think there are enough scarf tires along the pit road here for everybody to be able to not have to put new ones on. New tires may be a problem but if you put them on stickers. Uh, what about your driver? He had took a terrible jolt a week ago today at Pocono. Bruised his heart. Was in the hospital through Tuesday. What kind of shape is he in? Well, he seems to be uh, physically fine. Naturally, there's quite a great deal of soreness. Uh, his legs are sore. I think his, his upper body's sore, but he said he felt good. He didn't think he would tire. You know, this is not a really physical race, so he expects to be able to go all the day. It's a relatively cool day, and that'll make it easier on him, too. Okay, thank you, Travis Carter. Back to you, Ken. The scuffed tire's a major issue here. And it was interesting to hear Travis Carter say that the tires will be reusable. Of course, they haven't run more than 30 laps under green here so far, so I suspect we will see them put some of those tires back on a little bit later in the race. Did you see Harry Hyde smile when he was going through that? <laughs> I'll tell you, he's something else. Still under caution. Engine going on car number 30. Boiling down turn one. Hence the third caution of the afternoon. 71, 200 laps complete. Deployed out at first is Morgan Shepard, Harry Gant is second, Dale Earnhardt third. The date was July 18, 1958. The place, Toronto, Canada, car 142. The occasion, Richard Petty's first Grand National race. Over the 28 years since that day, Richard has written the book on stock car racing. A thousand career starts, 200 wins, including a record 10 in a row, seven championships and seven Daytona 500s. It all started with his father, Lee, a two-time champion himself. It began with Patriarch Lee, spans four decades and three generations. In the early days, Lee raced on the sands of Daytona with son Richard cheering him on. The team was always competitive, if not victorious. In 1959, the stocks moved to the new Daytona Super Speedway, and Lee was involved in one of the most controversial finishes ever. He, Johnny Bochamp, and Joe Wadley, a lap down, crossed the finish line in unison. Bochamp received the trophy, but three days later, after viewing photos, it was Lee declared official winner. Two years later, Lee and Bochamp were at it again. This time, neither made it to the finish. Over the wall in turn four. While Lee was recovering from his injuries, a changing of the guard began to take place. Here I am, 23 years old, and we've got the racing shop up here and everything, and there's nobody to run it. We had, uh, like, three or four people that worked for us. Well, I had to make, you know, I had to make enough money to pay them because at that time, there weren't any sponsors and we paid all the bills out of what we made out of the purse. That really put the pressure on us. 
Richard Petty handled the pressure like a pro. He not only managed the team, but managed to win a few races, including his first Daytona 500 in 1964. a big boost in my career, not only uh, to win a super speedway, but to win at Daytona. And anybody that wins at Daytona, it's, it's, it puts them from one plateau into another plateau. Richard Starr continued to rise. He rapidly proved himself a cut above the competition, winning three more Daytona 500s, including two in three years. There was a season with 27 wins, 10 in a row, and they started calling him King Richard. It seemed Petty's pit was victory lane. Every time he pulled in, he proved he deserved his title as the king of the road. Down off the high bank, fourth turn, onto the trioval, and the Petty Blue flies under the checkered flag, winner of the 15th annual Daytona 500. That was our heyday from early 70s to 75 and 76, and we were the dominant force in racing. We won the most of the races. Uh, you know, we've done everything there was to do. We won the championships. We won, you know, the races. We won whatever there was running. King Richard. King Richard. The heroic tales of King Richard spread quickly. In children's comic books, and then on to Hollywood's Silver Screen. Uh, it was a carburetor. Uh, I, I got the RPMs up now. In years to come, someone will ask, someone always does, about my wedding night. Well, I'm thankful I'll be able to look them straight in the eye and tell them that on my wedding night, the most important night of my life, Richard did finally get his RPM up. In time, like all celebrities, the king went commercial. He's a big star on the side of his car. There's an oval of red, white, and blue. But in 1981, after winning a record seventh Daytona 500, the Petty Empire When you crumbled. say sacrifice, what do you mean? Sometimes you have to put your family aside. Seems like to get the car ready. Crew chief Dale Inman left the team. In the years that followed, Richard posted only seven wins, culminating in his 200, while Dale guided Terry Labonte to a NASCAR championship. After four seasons apart, Richard and Dale reunited the team. Back together, they're looking to resume their winning ways. It was a good situation for both of us at this particular time. So circumstances dictate everything you do, and right now circumstances are dictating us to get back together. Though the winning spirit has been rekindled, the team has had his problems this season. No wins, two bad accidents, they don't shake his confidence. We wanted to try to build a, a strong team back again, and if it takes a couple of three years, then that's how long it'll take. But we don't feel like it, that it'll be that. But it's not a, a last year off deal. Uh, it's not a deal that I'm saying, okay, I'm going to do everything I can this year, and if I don't do it, I'm going to quit. Through good times and bad, the fans have always been loyal to Richard, and he dedicated to them. For 28 years and 1,000 races, they've been his inspiration and his success their reward. This portion of today's race is sponsored by STP. STP would like to point out how tough it is on the oil in your engine. Every day, your oil takes a beating as it tunnels its way through critical highways and byways. To help make it easier on your oil, we recommend STP oil treatment. STP adds extra lubrication to help reduce the wear and tear on your engine and on you. STP is the racer's edge. 
with you live with 76 of 200 laps complete in the Michigan 400. Harry Gant has once again exerted the power of number 33 to take the lead from Morgan Shepard running second. Dale Earnhardt maintaining third. Tim Richmond in fourth and Cale Yarborough in fifth. And we have a caution on the track once again, uh, Kent. There are 79 laps complete. Pretty good run here in the past few moments by Harry Gant to get him back out in front. And again, as we come to you live from Michigan, we're under caution for the fourth time today because of car number 98. What a bad break for Ron Bouchard, the Pittsburgh, Massachusetts campaigner. Evidently, the engine expired on his Pontiac, car number 98. Second engine in a row to let go and bring out a caution. And I want to apologize to Lee Petty. Gosh, Lee, I didn't mean to give you two championships when you were in three. <laughs> 71, Dave Marcus pulling around him. David is one of three drivers who made every race in this Michigan 400 series up here. Loves this track. Hope that Helen Ray car would have a good day. Richard Petty, incidentally, still a lap down and was last seen in 30th position in the event. Everyone a lap down, and he made that early stop on tires. And Willie uh, T. Ribs went out. He wanted to let us know he was all right. We got it here. Willie T. Ribs trying to do what only one other black driver in history has done, and that's win in Winston Cup competition. Wendell Scott won in Jacksonville, Florida. Field under caution. Back in a moment. Following in the footsteps of Richard Petty is, uh, it, they're definitely big footsteps. I think he followed in the footsteps of his father, and I'm following in the footsteps of him. But, you know, uh, Richard Petty's a legend, and it's, it's, I don't think you ever will ever come out from under the shadow of a legend. You just have to learn to live with it. Getting ready to resume here. Pace car, light off on it, indicative of a start this time by Rusty Wallace, lap car on the inside. And you're riding with Dale Earnhardt. He's in second place, ready to challenge number 33, the green car, Harry Gant, for the lead as we get going live again here at the Michigan 400. With Ned Jarrett, I'm Ken Squire, pit side, Chris Economaki, and Mike Joy bringing you the action. A quick word from Mike Joy. Dale Earnhardt's team is worried about tire wear. These new tires are mounted up, four sets of them, but they won't go on the car today. They're taking the tires that came off this car in earlier pit stops, putting them back on, and they bought two sets of tires from Willie Ribbs' team. Now the Ribbs is out of the race. Green. 83 laps complete, working 84. Bernhardt looks inside at turn one, coming to speed. Down they come for turn two. Out there with that wall, leaps out at you as you come off turn two. Bernhardt settles in. Hands high on the steering wheel. Goes looking for Gant. Down the back straightaway. He has about five car lengths separating him from the third place car. Now Bobby Allison in third, Bodine in fourth, Baker is fifth. Buddy Baker is fifth, the winner back here in 1979. Baker having a good run today. Back to the line they come. Tremendous crowd out. To the inside, Allison makes his move. That's Allison down low, all hooked up. And he's on his way looking for second. Bobby Allison, who's won this year, currently third in the points. Earnhardt back on the inside. There's your leader, and there's that battle for second position. Earnhardt winding up car number three, drives inside of Bobby Allison and fights him for second position back straight away. He picks up the draft and moves by with relative ease. From Bodine's car, looking over this battle for second place. Allison on the high side. Earnhardt low, give it back to Allison as they come to the stripe, and Bodine coming with him. Bodine going to third, Earnhardt dropping to fourth, Baker still fifth. And I think that's the reason with Bodine pulling up on the bumper of Bobby Allison, it was easy for Allison to pass Earnhardt on the outside. Riding with Jeff Bodine, hanging on to Bobby Allison into the back straightaway. To link up together those three cars again while they were racing for the second position has been able to pull away a little bit. Let's see if they can hook up together in the draft and run him down. On 25 car legs, first to second. And exactly what Ned Jarrett said at the top of the program has been proven out as we move toward the halfway point of the event. Harry Gantz, the man to beat. This car is really working nice. Seems like for those lap cars. And here's
trouble in turn one. Blown engine. Right in front of Richard Petty as they go into the turn. Petty slowed down and got down Jody on the inside. Jody Ridley. He loses an engine. That's the Raymond car. He pulls it down on the inside. Does a good job of getting it out of the way of the traffic. He kept it in a straight line until he could get it slowed down and then pulled it to the inside of the racetrack out of the groove. But the caution flag will come out, nevertheless, because he was up in the groove when the engine started to blow water and oil. Engines going off like penny firecrackers around here today. Yes, Third are. caution in a row for that. Here comes Gann in the pits. And Jeff Bo looks like Earnhardt and Jeff Bodine following him down uh, pit road, or at least Earnhardt is. Replay from Petty's car. Maybe we can see what happened here. They're going down the front straightaway, and you can see the engine just erupt, and you can see also that Richard Petty could not see. Let's go to Mike Joy. Harry Gant is getting four fresh tires on his car. The ones that come off have not been on there that long. At any time there's a caution flag, you want to take that opportunity and get fresh tires on the car. Travis Carter has a word with his driver and the NASCAR official has a word with him. Here's Travis. How about the tire wear now at this point of the race, Travis? Well, everything's been good for us, Mike. We haven't had any problem. We've stayed with scuff tires, and what we'll do is run them a few laps and change them and let them cool, and then we'll reuse those tires. And I think if we do that with the wear that the track's getting, I think everything's going to be all right. That seems to be the strategy all up and down pit road. Take those tires off, put them back on later in the race. Richard Petty coming in oil streaked windshield and you saw the reason why and that's CBS onboard camera here's Chris okay Richard Petty is in it seems to be a rather calm pit stop Petty's got that traditional rag in his head and they're spending more attention on the windshield than anything else it seems to be very calm here the yellow flag they know that they don't have to hurry and he's gone back into the action and right up here is Bobby Allison just going out Activity is on pit road. Chris Economaki moving down to the Bobby Allison pits. Chris, we've had, of the retirees so far, we're up to, uh, at seven retirees, six had blown engines, Chris. Only one had gone out with a rear end problem. All the rest are blown engines today, and I wonder if there may be a story developing there. I'll tell you, when you see that smoke coming up, it's not the smoke you worry about, it's the shrapnel that comes from those cars that start bouncing parts down the track toward you from certainly, another angle. Certainly does. The oil and the water will come out under the rear wheels, and we saw Willie Ribb spin earlier when his, and you can see his car, Jody Ridley, waving back and forth, but he was able to keep it, get it slowed down, keep it under control while the other cars go by on the outside. But yes, the oil, water, parts that come from underneath the car, that's the reason we have a caution. 89, 90 laps complete. The next time by, here's Chris. Okay, I'm at Bobby Allison's pit. We're better the man who logs the lap. How many tires has Bobby used up so far today? Uh, we've used uh, 16 now. And the four he started on makes 20, right? Right. Okay, there you go. There's going to be some tire bill in this pit. Down pit road to Mike Joy. Chris, every one of these tires tells a story. I'm in Harry Gant's pit. This was a right front tire for car number 33. It was demoted to right rear duty, and now it'll be set to go back on the right front. 1,200 is the compound number NASCAR allows on the right side of the car. Left side tires must be hardness number 1199. Well, why they move this tire around and put it in different places? It's because of the circumference. Here, written is 89 and a quarter inches. That will match up with a tire that will go on the left rear of the car. Apparently, they couldn't find one to match, so this tire, when it goes back on the car, will go on the right front of the automobile. It is a science. <laughs> it's not just magic. And every team has what they call a tire specialist who spends the whole day doing nothing but measuring tires, matching them up in pairs, so they can go on the car and have the absolute best combination possible, despite all the handling tricks, despite all the horsepower, these uh, four little patches of rubber are all that keeps that car in contact with the racetrack and going fast. No question about that. That's a very good report, uh, Mike Joy. All right, the field is still under caution. 90 laps have been complete. Here's Richard Petty's car number 43. Richard, that was almost too close for comfort down there in turn one, wasn't it? Well, it got pretty close, but when I'm bad, already behind, I'm a little more cautious right now. Let's take a look at it again here. As you went down into the first turn, Jody Ridley 
Looked like he really covered the old windshield up for you. That he did. He covered it up. I, I just knew where the racetrack was. I couldn't see, and then I made another lap. They all cleaned it all off. Ready to go now. How's the car running? Well, the car's running pretty good, but it ain't it's handling real good. But the main thing, we got a lap down because of, uh, they had a caution just as we lap. We cut a tire down to begin with, and that got us fine. Thank you, sir. Richard Petty, a lap down in this event to Jeff Bodine, Neil Bonnet, Ricky Rudd, Darrell Waltrip running up in front. More from Michigan Live shortly. And I guess you probably know I've been to probably more races than anybody else and ran again Richard more than anybody else from the time he started. I remember the first race he won in Columbia, South Carolina back years and years ago. So he's been a tough competitor ever since I've run again him and I know he's been tough for everybody else. The field is under green another time here in Michigan. Ricky Rudd, third, Waltrip back to fourth after being almost a lap down. Fifth, Terry Labonte, sixth, Joe Rutman, seventh, Tommy Ellison, eighth, Tim Richmond. Eight cars have retired, seven of them with blown engines. But here's the big factor, Ned. 27 cars as we come to the midway point. 93 laps complete this time by. 27 cars in the lead lap. The type of competition we have today, Ken, is not surprising. Of course, we have had a number of caution flags, which has, has helped that situation, but we've seen 15, 20 car drafts uh, running up front. Richard Petty, from Richard Petty's car, watching Ricky Rudd working on the outside. Remember, he's up to third spot. Petty being lapped and getting under. Ricky Rudd. Let's take a look at the attrition right now as the battle unsorts itself for a moment. Benny Parsons out very early in the going. DK's car, Willie T. Ribs. Ron Bouchard is away with the motor. Dave Marcus is number 71, has said goodbye. Jody Ridley, J.D. McDuffie. Let's talk to uh, Mike Joy about those engines. Well, this is Randy Dorton. He's in second place in NASCAR's engine builder point standings. His engines are under the hoods of Jeff Bodine's and Tim Richmond's car. What are causing all these engines to blow away today? I couldn't understand you, Mike. What's causing these engines to blow up today? Mike, we've come here to this racetrack and set track records and running six to seven mile an hour faster than we did before. So we're just running these things in a lot harder conditions we came here prepared for, actually. How many RPM are your motors turning today? We're operating at uh, 6,600 off the corner, going to accelerate to 79 to 8,000. That's a lot of beats per minute. Let's go to Chris. Well, I'm with Robert Yates, one of the most famous engine builders in NASCAR, who says that his engine is under the hood of Bodine's number five. Robert, seven engines have flown so far today. Why would today make so many engines blow? Well, the, I don't think anybody anticipated a race to be this fast to pace. And even with the gear selections that probably most of them have gone to, it's still cracking the engines really hard. How many more RPMs are usual? Well, normally we like to stay under the in the 78 range, and they're, they're above 8,000. And so that's going to, you know, some of them will make it, but some of them won't. Okay, there you have it. They're turning these engines, winding them right out of the chassis, as they say in racing. Back to you, Ken. 8,000 RPMs, 8,000 revolutions per minute. That's getting on a thin edge in these engines. It'll take its toll. No question about that, Ken. And another thing, when they get in the draft, as effective as we're seeing it here today, those RPMs go up another two or 300, and that adds more stress to it. In front for the moment, Bodine. Ricky Rudd has taken over in second place. Bodine is setting an incredible way. That's how far back as you look from Jeff Bodine's car to the rest of the field. He has a one and nine tenths second advantage, first to second place. Now here's Earnhardt beginning to gear up for a charge comes to the inside, and it's Earnhardt down to the bottom of the racetrack trying to move through. He's got some moving to do after that pit stop. He was well down at the start. Remember, 27 cars in the lead lap. Earnhardt is sandwiched right in the middle of that hustle going down into the first turn. That's Tommy Ellis directly in front of him there, former national sportsman champion of NASCAR. Right of Virginia. Touching Tommy Ellis and Richard Petty. Earnhardt trying to get sorted out of here. Traffic all over him and around him. Earnhardt had a decision 
decision to make. Should he follow Ellis through or Petty? He saw that Petty might be the fastest one, so he chose the 43 car. Out of Petty's car. There's Joe Rutman right behind him. He's amongst them there, isn't he? He sure is in a cluster. Now, there you see the interval. That's the leader, that yellow and white car going down into turn one. And then the Armada. Well, let's give a call to Ricky Rudd, who has done a good job of coming back. He was one of those drivers that had to fit early, an unscheduled pit stop. He managed to stay in the lead lap, Bud Moore and the crew got him back out, kept him in the lead lap, and he's fought his way back up now to second place. And into third moves Terry Labonte, dropping to fourth. Is Waltrip up to fifth, and into fourth goes Dale Earnhardt. One thing about Earnhardt, he is determined every inch of the way. The motors are right on in wherever he needs to go. And that car handles so well. He's been a dominant car on the circuit this year if there has been a dominant car. Hope she doesn't drop a stitch out there. <laughs> wow, look Hope at that. Hope these guys don't drop a stitch. Look at this. Four wide, down into turn one. Kelly Arbor right in the middle of it. Two rows of four wide. The halfway mark will be coming up the next time around. I tell you, the fans have already got their money's worth, but we got that much more to go. Bet they have. 99 laps complete. Cross flags this time by. Live on CBS, the Michigan 400, Richard Petty's 1,000th race, and for halfway, it'll be Bodine in the second spot of the line. There's the halfway mark out for Bodine in first, Ricky Rudd in second, Terry Labonte in third, Earnhardt in fourth, Waltrip in fifth, and Joe Rutman making a good accounting now. Kenny Rutman Bernstein's is, team. He's had some good runs in that car this year, Dan. He's had some trouble with it. Here's Earnhardt still moving up and moving up now on Ricky Rudd, the second place car. Notice how he used the bottom of the racetrack. It's cooled off down there, and he's getting a bite. He dives in. There's the leader, Jeff Bodine, looking for win number three of 1986. A fabulous victory at Daytona. An incredibly strong victory at Dover, Delaware. The torture Rack, the Monster Mile. There's that battle for second place as you see the interval from first to second in the rest of the field. While they're battling for that position, he's pulled away to a four-second lead. So, out in front, remains Bodine. The battle is dead even for second more for Michigan shortly. Richard and I have had our run-ins over the years, and, uh, you know, we've even knocked each other's fenders off a few times, but that goes without saying. Um, you know, we got out there, and, and we competed as hard as we could when we were on the track, but I really respect and admire him uh, on the track and off the track. Uh, he's a true champion. He's a guy that re has represented the sport of auto racing mighty well for as long as I can remember. 105 of 200 laps are complete in the Michigan 400. At the halfway point, we have had five caution periods. Eight drivers have retired from the race. Jeff Bodine is drawing a bead on victory here today, pulling away from the field with Dale Earnhardt in second. There's the Bodine car, number five, that is commanding this race. And let's look inside the car to see the gauges working on that machine. Well, this is what he has to look at, Ken, as he glances down occasionally up in the right-hand corner. We saw the at the water temperature gauge and then we see the fuel gauge and of course the oil pressure it's staying very very steady and let's let's take a look the, at the biggie there yeah that's the rpms and you notice that it's sort of sort of twisted around he wants it to look straight up the the, the uh dial to be straight up when it's uh, the way he wants the it last to thing you want to do is cock your head to that's see how right. that thing's reading exactly because sometimes as we already pointed out they're turning more rpms than they want to at times and he doesn't want to have to turn his head too far to see it The popcorn concessions aren't doing well here at all today. <laughs> too much racing Everybody, too much racing out here on the racetrack. Nobody needs to eat. After 200 miles, let's run down the top 10. First, let's take a look at the interval. There in front of this wonderful crowd, you see the leader, Jeff Bodine, with a handsome lead over Ricky Rudd, running in second place. Fine run for Ricky Rudd. Terry Labonte in third. Dale Earnhardt in fourth. And Darrell Waltrip still looking for his first win in the Michigan 400 in fifth. And the sixth spot is Joe Rutman. Going seventh is Tim Richmond. In eighth is Neil Bonnet. Morgan Shepard is in ninth. And Phil Parsons has come up into tenth spot. A little salute to Phil. And Phil's 
just had a technical problem. Evidently, he's out of the race or a mechanical problem. That was the standings at 200 miles, 100 laps complete. But Ian is able to pull away, Ken. He's not, uh, he, now that they've, Earnhardt has gotten up into second place, we thought he might be able to pick up on him, but that's not the case. But Ian running his own race out there and just pulling away from him. He is uh, leading by six seconds over this battle for second place that you see here on your screen. Earnhardt in number three in second. Terry Labonte right there in third. Tim Richmond in fourth and being challenged by Morgan Shepard. Ricky Rudd has come back a few spots. He's in sixth. Baker is back to seventh. Buddy Baker was up to fourth, then went back to 24th on a restart, and he's right back in it. Baker has real intentions on this race. Yes, he does. Having a good run here today. He and uh, Danny Shep own their own team now. And Buddy is the, the manager of it and doing a good job. Gary Nelson looking on as his car flashes by with a six-second-plus advantage. Petty, winner at Richmond, Virginia earlier this year. His first Winston Cup checker. Having trouble here today, just past the midway point, and Kyle getting ready to bring it in. This is the Wood Brothers car that has had uh, a number of victories here with David Pearson at the wheel in the past. Kyle, of course, the driver for the last couple of years. On pit road, car number seven. Special presentation to his dad down here today in the pre-race ceremonies had a flag that all the drivers had signed and gave to him, but it looks like Kyle's going to be out of it here today. In that feature that we saw about Richard Petty a few moments ago, it was Kyle Petty who helped lift his dad unconscious from that terrible crash at Charlotte, and Richard was back the next week. He, like all of them, any Sunday is a race day, any possible way, they'll be there to compete. Let's go to Chris Economaki. I'm with Gary Nelson, Jeff Bodine's crew chief. Gary got a big lead, biggest of the race. You've used fewer tires than anyone else. Things must be really right for you today. Well, first of all, I'd like to wish my dad happy Father's Day out in California. But uh, as far as the race goes, we're happy leading. There's still quite a ways to go. We're just over the halfway point. The problem we have is when we get in traffic, it's hard for Jeff to run as fast as he wants. When he can, when he can run by himself, he can use the whole track. He said he's the fastest car. really overstressing them. Uh, I'm surprised that they're holding up as well as they are, as hard as these guys are going in the turn. Okay, thanks very much, Gary Nelson. And now down pit road to Mike Joy. I'm with Bud Moore, the owner of Ricky Rudd's car. Good pit work got Ricky up to second on the restart, but he's starting to slip back a bit. Do you not have the right setup on the car, Bud? No, we're just pacing ourselves right now. We just, you know, they've had a little tire problem to start with, so we're just sort of pacing ourselves right now to get down towards the end and over the road. You've been looking at and measuring tires. What will you change on the next pit stop? What will you change on the next pit stop? Well, we didn't change anything on that pit stop. Uh, we just gassed and go, let him go. So uh, that's why we got up there. And uh, we're just pacing ourselves right now. So Rudd's tires have a few more laps on them with some of the cars that have gone by him and closer to the front. The, the lead is six seconds, by which car number five has the rest of the field in his clutches. Dale Earnhardt stays in second spot. Terry Labonte maintaining third. Richmond in fourth. And therein lies the battle. And it's a dandy. It's and going now, on. Ken, Harry Gant is beginning to move back into that pack. He had made a pit stop. And he has been the only car that has shown the strength that Jeff Bodine is showing here right now. Up so to fourth. Yes. Up to fourth. And there you see the green car, number 33. That's Gant tucked in behind Terry Labonte. Not for long. He wants to get untucked right about now. There's Morgan Shepard right behind the maroon car. And I believe that 88, that's that's Buddy Baker. Buddy having a good, strong run here today. He is having a great run here today in car number 88. That big, gentle giant from Charlotte needs one. He's had a, what, a third place this year. Other than that, it hasn't been a, a Baker day at all. Started all but three races here at Michigan. One of those was that... Uh, 500 miler back in 69 that went on until dark and thereafter. But he did win here in 79 when he was driving for the Rainier team. Of course, Cale Yarborough drives for them now. Oh, and Jeff Bodine continues to pull away. He's, he's gotten 
almost to an eight-second lead now. He, Gary Nelson, his crew chief, told, here's Baker, maybe we're going to be inside of Morgan, Morgan Shepard taking another position. Gary Nelson told Chris Economac there a moment ago that uh, he could run better by himself. I suspect that his car, the chassis on it, is a little bit loose, and when he gets in traffic, then that would give him a fit. But when he gets out by himself, as Gary Nelson said, he can use the whole racetrack and uh, he's able to pull away. Up in front of the Baker Shepherd confrontation, there is number 33 going under number three. Number 33 shooting down the inside and going in front of Dale Earnhardt is Harry Gant. So Gant takes over in second. The man with the big lead is Jeff Bodai. Well, let's see if he can pull away from that pack now and then cut down any of that distance that Jeff Bodai has been able to pull up. On those pit stops, Ned, when, when was five last around here for a pit stop? He pitted last on 67, according to the information we have here, which is about uh, almost 50 laps ago. So he, he'll be due for a pit stop before too long. Well, he's building a nice fat lead. Let's see if he can hold on to it here. Eight second lead, eight plus between first and second place. And second place, Dandy Battle, but now Gant has drawn away his way up through the field and Harry Gant crashing savagely in Pocono, Pennsylvania. This is not the worst wreck he's ever had in his life. Watch him have two fellas help him get into that car this morning to come out here and race and he's back to second place. And he's uh, putting a little bit of distance between himself and Dale Earnhardt after he was able to get around him. We'll check the difference and see if he's gaining on. The factors here, incredible speed. The tires and the engines with a rev counter blown out of them. Up over 8,000 RPMs today. At issue, whether or not tires, engines, men can run the distance. For sure, the drivers can go out here on 400 miles. They love this racetrack. But the other questions yet to be answered. The streets of Motown will come alive with the sounds of Formula One thunder for the Detroit Grand Prix next Sunday on CBS Sports. This is CBS. Live from the Michigan International Speedway, 119 of 200 laps are complete. On this two-mile track, Jeff Bodine dominates in car number five. He's pulled out an eight-second lead at issue when he's going to come in to pit. We're trying to get an interval now on him to give you a perspective on his advantage over the second-place driver, Harry Gant. Here comes Gant on the number 33, down into turn number one. Clock ticking away. Green and white colors of the Burt Reynolds Hal Needham car. There he is in that second spot. Gant in the second, Dale Earnhardt in third. Running in fourth, Tim Richmond, Buddy Baker in fifth, Morgan Shepard sixth, Terry Labonte seventh. Ricky Rudd is eighth, Bobby Allison ninth, Darrell Waltrip in tenth, Joe Rutman eleventh, Bill Elliott twelfth, Kaylee Arboro thirteenth, Bobby Hill in fourteenth, all in the lead lap. Ken, let's update the situation on Bedine. He was last in the pits on lap 87, not 67, so he should be able to run another 10 to 15 laps before he would be due for a pit stop. Here he is putting a lap on Mike Waltrip, the leading rookie on the Winston Cup Tour, son of his brother of Darrell Walter, the younger brother, number 23. Bodine away, back straight away, and still getting away from the field. Just incredible power being shown out of car number five. The car is certainly handling beautifully out there by himself, Ken. No question about it. If, uh, Gary Nelson said that it, when he was in traffic that it didn't work quite as well, but he has no problems out Pit. there by himself. Well, Bodine I mean, pitting. Pits right now. Bodine coming in. Here's, here's Chris. Okay, they're standing at the ready here for Jeff Bodine, the leader. Watch these men work. Paper on the front windshield. It's going to be right side side. Fuel, no chassis adjustment. That tells you that the car is handling perfectly. The clock ticks away as they wait for the right side rubber to get folded back off. The fuel is not in it yet. And the fire change is finished. Okay. And there we have a nice thing. 17 and 6 tenths seconds. And Jeff Bodine is back on the track. We had it. Now down to Mike Joy. 
And I'm at the autopsy of the Kyle Petty engine here in the garage area with car owner Glenn Wood. And Glenn, there's nothing visibly wrong with this engine. A few drops of oil on the concrete. How do you theorize what might have happened to it? Well, most of the time in a case like this, it'd be a valve or a valve spring, which wouldn't usually go out the bottom. Uh, it, it doesn't seem to be anything in the bottom end, so we'll just have to assume it's a valve or a valve spring. Have you had much valve train problems this year? This will be the first. It's a mystery to them as well as us. Tenth retiree, Kyle Petty, quid at 17, give or take, second. Pit stop on Bodai. Gant is now your leader over Earnhardt in second, Richmond in third, Shepard fourth, Baker fifth, Lavati sixth, Rudd up to seventh, Allison into eighth, Waltrip to ninth, Elliott to tenth, Rutman to eleventh, Kelly Arborough in twelfth, Bobby Hillen moves to thirteenth, Bodai fourteenth. And Buddy Baker just made a pit stop a moment ago, Ken, for tires on the right side, and uh, both of them, he and Bodine, would stay in the lead lap. They got their service quick enough to get back out and stay in the lead lap. There's Gant, number 33, scooting down at a turn number one with about a 10-car length advantage over second place man Dale Earnhardt. Darrell Waltrip in car number 11. He is being shown in 10th position, and he's only won one race this year. He talked to us about winning fewer races than in the past. We'll get to that in a bit. Car number 11, Darrell Waltrip in that 10th running position. Gant staying first, Earnhardt in second, Richmond third. Let's see if Gant... Gant coming by in the lead, and he is now drawing away, Ned. Yes, he's, uh, after he got around Dale Earnhardt, he gradually started pulling away, not with the lead that Jeff Bodine had, but nevertheless, he's about to lose Earnhardt to the ground. The race stabilizing for the moment. NASCAR champion Darrell Walter would likely have a problem winning a popularity contest with fans. His manner can often be described as both outspoken and irreverent, but there is a different side to Darrell Walter. Bill Elliott says the guy leading the points is the guy that's really under the pressure because the guy behind can go for broke. How would he know? <laughs> but there's another story to be told. Just give it up. I know you want to let go. Give it all to Jesus. Let him free your troubled soul. Oh, Daryl's a regular member of a Bible study group that meets early Tuesday mornings in his garage. It's a time for humor, camaraderie, and more serious matters. This is going nationwide. <laughs> Give him the address out. <laughs> One day I have a meeting with me watching TV and we'll see Daryl zooming around the track and then they'll say here's a day in the life of Daryl Waltrip and, and then they'll show him the Bible study and then the guy come on and say, believe it or not. <laughs> what, time is the, what time is the minister getting here? <laughs> Very very seriously, I would like to take a look at a fellow named Paul or Saul, as you may know him as uh, Saul is his Hebrew name and Paul is Greek name. And let's take a look at it in Acts 8, where we were last week. They're Franklin, Tennessee businessmen sharing in a common religious experience with Daryl. Spiritually, he's helped us uh, by, by his witness of, uh, of the Lord. Um, but as far as the celebrity aspect of it, that's totally out of the question. He's a friend and a brother in the Lord. And um, he, he has a need, and I, I hope we're meeting his need. This Tuesday morning thing is my Sunday morning at the church, and um, it's what I draw from the whole week. It's improved the quality of my life, and it's, it's improved the, uh, the way I act and handle myself at the racetrack and in basically everything I do. pretty jarring experience hitting the wall and also it was a, a real awakening for me and, and my family and all of us that you know I could get hurt driving a race car I never really thought much about that I think that experience I think that weekend uh, we rode back in the van and Stevie drove and I, I didn't even remember coming home and uh, we talked a lot after that about our lives and uh, I think that was a turning point uh, in our lives is Daryl different he is a oh. gentler, more peaceful um, person. Uh, 
more satisfied and uh, easier to um, easier to like himself, I think. The naysayers and the fault finders will say, well, Waltrip's found another gimmick. <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> the, uh... They're going to see um, that it's not just a fad or a phase, that it really is real. And if they don't see that, it's, it's still not going to affect where he is and what kind of person he is or what he becomes. What is this obsession with animals? I think they must fill a void for Daryl and I because we've wanted children a long time and we don't have children. We collect all these animals and, and we love them and hug them and kiss them and discipline them and and of course they're not like children but for the moment i guess they're the closest thing that we have what else is there for daryl waltrip just to continue to grow as a as a as a christian and as a race car driver as a citizen and uh, i just like to continue to excel in all those areas and, and just to uh, hopefully have an impact on the sport a positive impact why don't you like a loser when they have that chance again? All right. Darrell Waltrip currently, Kaylee Arbor, we're coming up on green flag stops. The race has stayed stable over the past several laps, and with 132 laps complete, Kale is in among the leaders. There's Stevie Waltrip scoring for husband Darrell today. Hey, I kind of a pride. They lost old Frank Cannon, their, one of their favorite dogs in that group here. Had to put it to sleep ago. because of cancer two weeks ago. A very sad moment in their life. Richmond Pits, Tim Richmond on Pit Road, has been running in fifth. And we are up to green flag pit stops. Tim Richmond trying to move that car out, the TG Shepard car. They're going all the way around. Four tires on the car number 25. They're going all the way around on Richmond's car. So they get him back on the track. And the caution is coming out, and that's a, at a bad time, time for Tim Richmond. A hard one. 133 laps are complete, and the caution comes out. That's the six of the day, Ned. And the record for this race is eight, set back in 1969. Well, there's Yarborough, and that's, that's still in there. Let's go to Mike Joy on that story. You're looking at Cale Yarborough's car. The right side is really crumpled. Cale has hit the wall. And he is about to climb out of the car. They're talking to him now. Waddell Wilson is unhooking the safety gear. And Kale appears to be a little groggy. They're working on the right front of the car as if they intend to get it back in the race. But here is the man from Timmonsville, South Carolina. And he has climbed out, talking to crew chief Waddell Wilson about what happened. Kale, what happened? Blow the tire. Kale is OK and just needs to catch his breath. The crew is still working on it. We have a replay. We can see what happened to Kale just moments ago here in car number 20. From inside Bodine's car, let's watch what happened. Now, the leaders are pitting. Allison is in. Baker is in. Earnhardt is now in. Under caution, we are. And Kale, apparently the tire blew and into the wall he went, then down to the inside of the track. Let's go to Chris Economac. Uh, Darryl Waltrip is in for a pit stop, and it looks like there's more than the allowed number of men over the pit wall here, but these rules have not been enforced too rigorously. Maybe he's going to get tires on both sides of his number 11 car. Junior Johnson is going over to the left front. Man, the fuel is in. And here he goes. Now, that was a very fast four-tire stop. Back to you. Kelly Arborough's number 28 down for the day. And they're still talking. He really took a lick. The six-time winner of this event. As tough a racer as ever in the history of the sport. It's a tough break because he has run a very hard race. Coming Excellent from 28th race. position. Actually led the race at one point. But now out of it. He's telling Waddell Wilson that it, I'm okay. Just I just need to get my breath here for a moment. But uh, I'm sure he gave him a pretty good jolt. A lot of good drivers taking a lot of hard licks this year. Think of last week. Think of Petty. Both at Charlotte in practice, as well as what we saw in the Daytona race. Can the car get back in the race? No, we're not going to put it back in. We're just trying to get it to where we can move it right now. And, you know, Kale trying to get his breath because he took a hard lick down there. So I don't think he really would want to get back in it. And in none of these conditions, I don't want him in it. 
Boy, Kale, you guys were really running at the time that happened. It looks like you had a good shot for today. Well, yeah, the car got to pushing a little bit there right at the end, and I guess that's what blew the tire. It pushed and wore the, wore the tire out. But we need the caution, and we caused it. With the new pavement, with the speed that everybody is running, are they trying to go too fast for conditions, or just are the cars just not set up properly to take advantage of this new surface? Well, the racetrack's a super shape. It's an ideal racetrack. Uh, you know, we just just one of those things, really. All right. These tires have safety inner liners, but apparently everything let go when you got up there? Everything blew, yeah. Right between turns three and four, and it just turned to the right. Well, this is Mike, the toughest guy in stock car racing, but he's out right now. Mike Let's go Joy, to Chris. Mike, yes, Ken. Can you get a word with Waddell? Uh, he said under these conditions. Was he referring to the condition of the cars or referring to something else about this race today? Waddell, you were saying under these conditions. Did you mean about the conditions to the car or the conditions that we're racing under today and adapting to this new track? Oh, no, not that. What I meant is, you know, the car is in bad shape, and then Kale, you know, took a hard lick, so I don't think he was capable of getting back in the car, even if the car was capable of running, which it is not. We're just trying to get the car now that we get it off the pit road. Tough break for you guys today. Now, if they were running for the national championship, chances are this car would likely get back in the race. But the Rainier Lundy team runs a limited schedule. They're here to win. And if they can't go out and win, something like this happens, they really don't need to finish. Let's go to Chris. Okay, we're down here in Tim Richmond's pit. These are the rear tires that just came off of his car. That yellow flag was a very fortuitous one for Richmond, as you can see. Here's the front tires that came off. You can see the difference in the tire wear. So this yellow flag was a boon for Tim Richmond in car 25. Back to you. Remind you, the incident took place at the top of turn four that brought out this caution period when Kaylee Arborough was eliminated from the Michigan 400. More in a moment. Richard Pitt has always been a big rival of mine because he's been hard to beat. And, uh, you know, every time, as I say, every time we go to the race, uh, Richard Petty is a man to beat in, in any given race. And we've been rivals, but we've also been friends throughout the years. Have you dreamed of Thirty-seven of 200 laps complete. Dale Earnhardt has the lead with Harry Gant now in second. Neil Bonnet in third. Bill Elliott in fourth, last year's winner. Bobby Allison remains in fifth position for the moment. Those are the top five. There you see the number 28 car, Waddell Wilson, who was just adding to someone down there. He had no idea that Cale had crashed that hard. He didn't communicate that. When the car came in, they thought it had slapped the wall, and then they realized that he was groggy, that he had taken a terrible lick. And we have another angle. I think we can get an idea about just what kind of a lick he took right now, Ned. Well, this will be at normal speed as he went into the turn, and you see him just go up. He clips the wall pretty good. And Ken, as he comes back down, it looks like that the inner liner is still up on that tire as he comes around. But with the banking not as high here as it is at Daytona and Talladega, uh, it doesn't, uh, when it goes down just a little bit, that outer liner going, and then uh, it shot him into the wall. Just taken to the ambulance, Kaylee Arborough. That'll be for a checkup. Of course, we've, we have talked with him, and so Betty Jo and the girls are watching back in South Carolina. I don't think she was here this weekend. They know that he's, uh, of course, he's walked into the ambulance. That is the sixth caution of the day as Kaylee Yarborough is eliminated, a tire blowing in the turn four area of this two mile track. It's the 12th retiree from the event. You're inside Jeff Bodine's car for a moment. Let me remind you again that next Sunday, CBS Sports will present starting at one o'clock Eastern, the United States Grand Prix, the Detroit Grand Prix. Nigel Mansell, who was victorious this afternoon in Canada. Elaine Prost was second. Nelson Piquet of Brazil was third, which means that in the World Formula One standings, Prost is first and just two points behind. There is now a tie for second place with Mansell and Ayrton Senna. Deal ready to resume. Again, as we get ready to get the green again, it is waiting. That Tim Richmond is one lap down now. He was caught in the pits when the caution came out with a four-tire change. Neil Bonnet also had just pitted, so he won.
point a lap down. On Bow, getting nailed by Tommy Ellis was Earnhardt at the start. Tommy Ellis clipping, as you saw, the rear end of number three, and Earnhardt just picks it up and keeps on moving. I want to see that again. I'm sure you do too, Ned. That was an incredible ball. They were just coming to speed, and he had him turn sideways. Earnhardt drove away from it and kept on coming. And 47, Morgan Shepard's car appears to be slowing as he went into turn three as we see some jostling back in the pack. Now that car way up against the wall, the red, white, and blue car is Ellis. It looks like he's got a handling problem, and Ellis is now falling back. He, he was the one that touched a moment ago. Battle for the lead. Battle for the lead. Earnhardt and Gant going into the first turn. Harry Gant tucks it on the inside, and it's Harry Gant back in front. Dale Earnhardt is in second. Bobby Allison in third. Back straight away. Let's go to Mike Joy. Morgan Shepard has just pulled the Race Hill Farm Buick to the garage area. Car owner Jack Beebe, what happened? Transmission uh, let go in it. Uh, well, you had a strong win at Atlanta, and it's been tough sledding ever since. Oh, we've been running right up there. We'll, we'll get him. Well, this man not only owns the car, he pays all the bills, he and his wife. The car has no sponsor, but they're looking. And the way Morgan runs, they'll find one. In the third, Bobby Allison. Bill Elliott is in for Richmond, a lap down fortunate time when he pitted and then the caution came out that trapped him. But he wants to get up and get that lap back. He scoops onto the inside of Bill Elliott. The number 25 maroon car bottom, the T.G. Shepard car, trying to get back in this race. The owner of the Richmond car, which has had two seconds and a win in his last three outings, is standing by with Chris Economac. I'm with T.G. Shepard, who, well known as a singer, he sang the national anthem to open the activities today. What's your role with Car 25, T.G.? Well, I'm the spokesperson for the race team on behalf of Folgers Coffee, and uh, we blend country music along with racing. As, as a singer, as a singer, what's this noise doing to your ears? Well, it's pretty tough on the ears when you have to work each day like I do. Uh, I'm going from here to Los Angeles to do a TV show, and I hope they can hold out. Well, okay, T.G. Shepard of friendly figure along pit road this year nascar grand national racing back to you ken chris he was in nashville last night and he's in los angeles tonight i think it's a late performance around 10 or 10 30. Are you, now are there's you richmond going los underneath angeles tonight uh i'm flying out at 7 40 tonight to go out and do some tv out there yeah oh, he's on your horse tg shepherd again there he is trying to get underneath elliot of course rick hendrick rick is the, hendrick is the owner. owner yes and richmond fighting hard to try to get up there and get his lap back i think tg would like to be the owner he, you know, he, he came in, he talked to, to Needham two or three years ago, really wanted to get into this thing and tried in every way he could to find a way to get involved. Good battle for second going on here. Bill Elliott now beginning to yeah. ramble a little bit up there in car number nine. He may have just been lying there waiting for this time in the race. Now, for Jeff, this time, we've come to 143 laps. Not too long ago, Jeff Bodine was the class of the deal. He'd run away to an almost a nine-second lead, but now he's buried back in the back at about four seconds behind the leader, and his crucial Gary Nelson said that he couldn't run that well in traffic, and boy, he is in it now. Again, springs out, has himself about a half and three-quarters of a second advantage over the second-place red car, number nine, the Ford Thunderbird of Bill Elliott. And then there's about a five or six car separation. Bobby Allison coming up next in third. There's number nine, Elliott, very much back in the game today. The winner of this event for the last two years. And Mike Joy is with Ernie Elliott. Here's oldest brother Ernie, the crew chief and engine builder on this car. You guys are a factor, maybe for the first time today. Have you been hanging back and just kind of riding along? Or has he been pushing that car as hard as he can? No, we've been running pretty hard. I think everybody else is having a little problems now. And I hope we're getting ours sorted out. We've had some problems up until now with tire blistering and, you know, just the various little things. Couldn't get the chance to get those so now, maybe things are okay. If you have to go harder, do you have any left? If you have to go harder, do you have any left? We're riding as hard as we can go. And so is most everybody else at this point. Ken? You know, unlike a few years ago, Ken, when you could sort of loaf around and, uh, and win races, it's not that way anymore. Somebody is going to run hard, and when somebody does, everybody else has to. There can be no tortoise in the hair here. No, you just go out there and run her flat out and hope it lasts. Here's Elliot trying to close it back up another time on Harry Gant for the lead. Allison line third, Earnhardt fourth, Baker fifth, Waltrip sixth. 
Ruttman seventh, Ricky Rudd eighth, Rick Wilson into ninth, Terry Labonte into tenth. Rick Wilson with new sponsorship on that McClure car has become a real factor, I would think, before the year is out. He's a terrific driver. Yes, he is. And the Morgan McClure team out of Abington, Virginia, have, have paid their dues in this sport, and it's good to see them get a national sponsor on the car, and I think they'll do well for it. Elliott seems to be cutting in to Gant's lead. Yes, he is. The car working very nicely, Ken, in the center of the racetrack. He is definitely Ken on Harry Gant. And there is Allison being challenged by Dale Earnhardt in fourth, directly behind Earnhardt comes Buddy Baker, who is mounting a great effort today. Baker has run as good as we've seen him uh, this year on the super speedways. Of course, he's only running the super speedways this year. side goes Bobby Allison and down to the inside number three the yellow and blue colors of that Chevrolet for Richard Childress racing stables and they are pulling up a spot meanwhile up in front Elliott is definitely closing on the leader a lot of fans will be happy to see that because Bill Elliott has had a tough year as you said at the top of the show his best effort has been three fifth place finishes so far on the regular schedule he's there Bill Elliott ready to go for the lead. Meanwhile, it's three wide, three wide for the third position coming to the line. Behind the leaders. Crowd up on their feet watching this battle for the lead. And directly behind them now, they've come back to two abreast. Bobby Allison there, Earnhardt there, Baker on the inside. And they're three wide again. Earnhardt in the middle, he gets squeezed in, had to get out of it. Just ease up on the throttle a little there. He said, I don't know this, leading the point standings. Baker to the inside. Allison on the outside, directly in front of Earnhardt. That's third, fourth, and fifth. Now, Baker is absolutely having himself a good time. It's been a while since he's been able to get up there and really mix with them, and I'll guarantee you he's one of the happiest drivers out there other than maybe Bill Elliott. 148 laps complete, and look at the scramble up in front. Bill Elliott on the inside, the bandit, Harry Gant outside, into turn one. The Ford Thunderbird noses out in front. The fans come to their feet here uh, in Michigan. The pool hall in Dawsonville, Georgia, just gave him a standing ovation. Down they go in the back straightaway. Car number 33, Gant, now chasing Elliott. And this is only the sixth race that Bill Elliott has led this year. And last year, he came into this race and had won six races. Made it seven with this event. For turn four, Gant closes on the outside. Bill Elliott out in front. They've got the motors all the way over, red lighting them all the time. And the fans excited about this. Elliott is so popular throughout America. His car owner, Harry Melling, is from Jackson, Michigan, just down the road here from the Michigan International Speedway. They had a big outing for him on Friday night here. We were able to go by and visit with some of the folks there. Had hundreds of people out here in the country at one of the clubs here. Just a very nice affair. Bill Elliott is really kind of America's pride. Easy going, soft spoken, very determined, very deliberate driver. Lots of rumors about him for next year. And some of them now centering on Junior Johnson, of all people. Now, boy, wouldn't that be interesting? Uh huh. I wonder if there's a Ford in his future. <laughs> Here he is out in front and trying to draw away from Harry Gant. The last time we visited the Elliott clan in the mountains around Dawsonville, Georgia, we found that the mountain folks protect their secrets well. Secrets that won the Elliott's over $2 million last year. We were there again recently to find out how all that money might have changed things for the Elliott's of Dawsonville, Georgia. The $2 million hasn't changed much in Dawsonville. The barber shop still closed on Wednesday. Pool hall still notes Bill's accomplishment on the window. And Betty's Country Store is having a giant winter sale. However, there's some excitement at Rooster's Place. Things are busier these days thanks to number nine memorabilia. We had a bunch of tourists come through. That helped business good because more Bill wins, more tourists we get. We're hoping this year he'll win the point standing and win the million again. Ernie Elliott was unavailable, working as usual behind closed doors. But Brother Bill was willing to show off his latest pastime. For recreation, Bill likes aerobatics, like racing. It's not for the weak of stomach. He convinced me to go for a spin. Every minute of flying you do is just like driving a race car. That's experience. That's something that might get you through one situation that that lack of experience wouldn't have got you through. I really don't know what the limit is. I haven't found it yet, but <laughs> I'm working on it. Boy, it sure is pretty up there. Hey, 
Oh, that was wonderful. Yeah, I become a part of the plane. I guess that's what I like about it. Same way with a race car. You become a part of the race car and feel everything that it does. If I couldn't race, I guess that's what I'd do would be fly. What did the million dollars change? Has it changed anything? I don't think so. You know, as far as the money goes, the money ain't really what makes me get up every morning. You know, it's a part of it to, to keep a living, to make a living. But as far as to make you do the things you need to do, you know, I like the challenge of, of just driving a race car and working on a race car. Are the brothers as solid as they were a year ago? I think so. Uh, I feel like 85 wore on us quite a bit as far as everything we went through, as far as the whole team's concerned. And I don't know how many more years you'd be able to stand a year like 85. You know, the, all the attention, all the focus, you know, all the pressures involved because, you know, you can only take so much. Things are slowly changing. Bill and Martha still live in the basement of Mama Reese's place. She felt a little peaked and didn't want to chat. Bill and Martha are moving up the road to Amicalola Falls. And by the way, Ernie's broken ground for a new engine shop. It'll be larger, more modern. But one thing will never change. These mountain folks, friendly, but secretive. Well, things haven't changed much up in front. Bill Elliott is still first, Harry Gann is in second, but there's a new third place man. Buddy Baker is on the move, and Baker is now taken over in third. More in a moment. A thousand starts is an unbelievable number. Richard Petty has been in every event that he could be in since he started in 1958. Unbelievable number. We're back with you live at the Michigan International Speedway where Bill Elliott and the Ford Thunderbird have taken over. It's Harry Gant running in second, Bobby Allison third, Dale Earnhardt maintaining fourth, Buddy Baker is in fifth, and Dale Earnhardt has just pulled on pit road. Earnhardt, who had been holding on to the fourth position, is now pitting. Jeff Bodine has taken over in that slot. We're watching these pictures live from Michigan International Speedway on this Father's Day inside of Earnhardt's car. He's wanting to go, and they get his service, right side tires. He is away 12 and a half seconds. That's one of the fastest pit crews in the world, Ken. They've proven that. They've won the world championship of pit crew competition for the last two years. Hear that engine sing as Earnhardt gets back into it. Does not go a lap down. Meanwhile, up in front, leaders are number nine. Bill Elliott, the red and white Ford, and the number 33 Chevrolet, Harry Gant. The car maintaining third position. Harry, Harry Gant in second. Buddy Baker is in third and is doing just a terrific job. We'll get back on that story. There is the Baker car. Get to Mike Joy in just a moment. There is Baker running in third. And behind him, he's got a fairly good interval between himself and the fourth place car at this juncture, Jeff Bodine. Of course, the car number 25 is directly behind him, Tim Richmond, but he's a lap down. Lap down indeed. There's Jeff Bodine trying to close in. Remember, he had everybody covered just before the midway mark. Now he's running solo by himself, and he may be able to clamber up and take a shot here at Baker before too much longer. More of the front runners coming into the pits, kid. Allison. Allison pitting, and also Terry Lovati is on pit road. Let's check on the leader with Mike Joy. Well, it's not at the leader anymore, Ken. It's the second-place car, that of Harry Gant. Crew Chief Travis Carter watching Gant coming off that fourth corner. He told us earlier they were going to ride a while. A few minutes ago, Ernie Elliott said Bill was pushing as hard as he can, and Elliott's taking the lead. Travis, are you, are you riding along right now like you said you would for a while? Well, I think Bill's just a little quicker right now, and we're running about the same pace we've run throughout the day. Has a, the car goes away a little bit. I'm afraid we won't be able to outrun it. You'll have to make one more pit stop. What will you change on the car when you do? Well, everything depends on how the tires work. I noticed the three came in and changed. Evidently had a problem. And, and if our tires don't give us any problems, we'll just dump some gas in it and go. Let's go down pit road to Chris. Okay, I'm here with Howard Upstate, Buddy Baker's crew chief. I see Buddy just lost a position to Tim Richmond out there. Is the car okay? 
Yeah, the car's running good, but uh, the tire problem with blistering. We're going to have to pit here in a little bit, like all the other teams are having to pit too, but uh, it'll be all right. It's running good. Will he be able to go any faster for the remaining distance once he gets fresh rubber? Well, that's the object of the game. That's what we're hoping for. Okay, there you have it from Buddy Baker's crew chief. Just fell from third to fourth. Back to you, Ken. Thank you, Chris. 164 laps complete. Now, remember that the 25 car is a lap down. At number 25, of Richmond, there's the leader, number nine, Elliott, and there's 33 Gant right there. And directly in front of the leader is Terry Labonte, who just came out of the pits. In fact, Elliott pulled alongside it, Ken, when uh, Terry first came out. But Terry was able to move back ahead as a result of having new tires. The new tires will run a little bit faster. And, and it takes just a moment or two to finally get used into that asphalt. Yes, and of course, Terry would like to stay in front of him in case a caution comes out. Well, he would remain on the lead lap. Elliott trying to make it three in a row in the Michigan 400. He won his first super speedway race here in 1984 at this track after having been victorious at Riverside, California. Can he do it again? He was a heck of a competitor, but when he climbed out of the race car after 500 miles, he had time to talk to the fans, sign autographs, pose for pictures, whatever. Of all the people that I've seen come down the road in 27 years I've been covering the sport, it's, he's probably had more impact on stock car racing than anybody that I know. Bill Elliott is leading going for three in a row here in the Michigan 400. With his Ford, Harry Gant is in second. Buddy Baker is maintaining third. Bodine in fourth. And Joe Rutman is in fifth position, having a great run in the Kenny Bernstein car today. Let's take a look at attrition for a moment. Engines seem to be the major part of the story here today as we look down through those who are no longer in competition, starting with Benny Parsons early on. And there's a few names to add to that list. Morgan Shepard is out. Kelly Arborough is out. Mike Laws has gone out of competition as well. There you see the remainder of the cars that are out of the race. 41 started, 28 remain on the track, hammering it out for $476,000 today. Now, here's an interesting guy, Chet Phillip, IndyCar driver. He's been here on four previous occasions with the open cockpit cars, is up to 10th position, and he's a rookie out of Ozona, Texas, and making an excellent run here. His brother is his crew chief. They've now settled in to uh, North Carolina, and uh, his wife very much, Julia, part of that racing team, and they hope to make a home in Winston Cup competition. They they found what they want to zero in on, Ken, and I'll tell you, I'm impressed with the young man. Running in 10th place right now ahead of Dale Earnhardt and Darrell Waltrip, uh, just uh, having a beautiful run. And it's only his seventh start in, in uh, stock car racing. The leader, and there you see Terry Labonte, as he was before, directly in front of leader, Bill Elliott, number nine. 170 laps complete, Ned. And there again, keeping the pressure on Bill Elliott. He hasn't made any attempt to pass him since Elliott went by, but Gant has stayed right with him now. Maybe he is going to try to pass him. On the occasion of Richard Petty's 1,000 start, back in the field, the Petty story up in front. It's Elliott versus Gant. Look at that traffic directly. You see Bill Elliott sorts himself out. Might be wide time to here. pass Terry Labonte now. He's stayed behind him long enough. Make it three wide as he passes Mike Walter. And here comes Gant on the outside. Gant making a move on the high side. Goes back in first place. Well, what a move. He took advantage of the situation there. He was wide awake. Terry Gant, number 33, out in front. The laps begin to trickle away now. 28 cars. Still in competition out here. 22 back in 1969 when 38 started today we have 41 on the starting grid led by tim richmond 38 of the starters had broken the record only at a year ago this new paving here on this track making a dramatic six and a half mile an hour difference here's mike joy I'm in the Bill Elliott pit, and they're not moving too fast just yet. He is scheduled in about lap 176, as each of the leaders will need another pit stop. They're keeping a close eye on Harry Gant's bandit team because they're right next door. But the advantage belongs up at this end of pit road, because consistently throughout this season, the Chevrolets have gotten better gas mileage than the four. If this race stays green, Elliott will have to pit three, perhaps five laps before Gant comes in, even though they both made their last pit stop at lap 134. Thank you, Mike. Third spot, Baker. Fourth spot, Bodine. Fifth spot, Rutman. Sixth, Ricky Rudd. Seventh, Waltrip. Eighth, Hillen. Ninth, Wilson. Tenth, Chet Phillip. Back 
second, 11th, Dale Earnhardt, and 12th, Terry Labonte. So that would be the 12 cars on the lead lap because Labonte is just, well, let's see, they just put him a lap down a moment ago in that pass made by Gant. And they came through that heavy traffic. So that means there are 11 cars on the lead lap at this point. Kenny Schrader about to be overwhelmed by those two leaders. Kenny has had some problems with this car here. He was a rookie of the year in 1985. But he moves up a little there, too, now. Yes, he does. I don't think the car is handling exactly the way that he would like for it to, but he's a very observant driver and keeps everything in perspective. Caution is on the speed So they'll get to make that last pit stop under caution. And then we have 11 cars in the lead lap to shoot it out for the finish. Oh. We have ourselves a race, Mr. Jerry. Yes, we do. No have. question about it. No 100. surprise either. It'll be a, like a 25-lap sprint from here. They have 174 complete. They need to top the tank, change the tires. Most opportune time. It'll be like a Saturday night shootout on one of the short oh, tracks. Oh, boy. Like Rougemont last night. Caution is out. As to the reason, we're... Apparently there's debris on the track out. or something. Wonder if some of those tires are chunking, something they've spotted out there. Could very well be. Let's see the leaders. Here they are, all ducking on pit road. As the leaders come in, we'll go to Mike Joy. Here, here is Harry Gant and Bill Elliott pitted just one pit in front of him. Gant will take on right side tires. Meanwhile, Ernie Elliott having a look over at the Gant stop as they complete their work. Elliott is also getting right side tires with a caution out for debris, metal debris on the track. Elliott will go for four, so will Harry Gant. Fresh rubber all the way around. Here's Chris. Well, Buddy Baker is getting a second tank full of gas, which is rather surprising. There's only 50 miles of racing left, and the cars are supposed to be able to go 100 miles on a tank full, but they've gas all the way up. They're having trouble getting the right up their wheel off. Now, this is a long stop. This is going to be costly for Buddy Baker. One of the lug nuts was off. Uh, that was a costly one. We'll see where he is standing when he gets back on the track. It's a break for Buddy. We're going to Earnhardt. We'll see Buddy Baker's son Brian there for a moment. Now, here we're in Earnhardt's car. Earnhardt had made a pit stop under the under the green earlier, Ken, but he remained in the lead lap. So this gave him the opportunity to catch up to the field and come in, of course, and get service like everyone else. But he, he would be coming into the pits a little bit late, so that would mean he'd be back in the back. I wonder if Baker wanted an additional weight, took on that additional fuel. Well, I don't know. They set the cars up to to operate their best when the fuel is is about the halfway point, when it's about half empty. So that's the position you'll be in at the end of the race, so maybe it would work best for you. Mike Waltrip in, leading rookie. Here's Mike Joy. I'm with Richard Childress, car owner for Dale Earnhardt. We talked earlier about the advantages to the head end of pit road. Bill Elliott completed his service and took off, and here's Dale Earnhardt coming down to get into the pit lane, and they banged together pretty good. Yeah, everything was everything was okay right now. Uh, they just touched a little, but it did slow down. You were getting in and out of the pits. Yeah, we had we were we had to pit earlier on the tire problem, so that put us a little further behind. That's the reason we were we had to make an extra lap. But I say the collision on pit road slowed down. You're getting in and out of the pits. Yeah, that's right. It did. So that will be costly. Not so much under the caution flag as it would have been under green. But these days, these teams make their yellow flag pit stops just as fast as the green ones because getting up toward the front of that line for the restart is a lot easier coming off pit road than it is trying to pass some of these cars on the racetrack under green. Less than 25 laps to go on our live flag to flag coverage of the Michigan 400, and we'll return with more live action from the Michigan 400 after this word from your local station. 177 of 200 laps have been completed. 178 when they come by this time, they're in three, and they'll be back under green. 22 laps remaining to decide the $476,000 pot of gold this afternoon. The pace car is in. 11 cars are in the lead lap. Ladies and gentlemen, you're in for a showdown here today on CBS. Green flag is out from Harold Kinder. The field breaking with Gamp first. Elliott second. Down they come. Bob
Bobby Hillen in third. Bodine fourth. Ricky Rudd fifth. Baker six. And here's Tim Richmond and Terry Labonte trying to get their lap back. They're both a lap down, and they pull ahead again going into turn one. number 44 gets his lap back. Gant trying to take it away on the outside. Back straight away. Could be an incredible finish. Remember, 25 and 44 are one lap down to the leaders. Gant at 33 first. And now it's go for it time. Whatever they've been holding, they've got to lay their cards on the table. Here comes Elliott in number nine on the outside, pulling up. Of course, for them to get their left back, for it to be significant, there'd have to be a caution can for them to go all the way around and catch back up to the back, because I think in the short period of time we have left, they can't run fast enough to catch up to the leaders. Certainly changing how they're running the race, though. They haven't got the groove they want. The groove they want is what... Richmond is taking, and Labonte from Bodine's car. He closes up on Bobby Hillen. Now, Hillen is having the best day. The Stamola, number eight, the second car. Allison, one part of the team. There goes Bobby Hillen, youngster out of Midland, Texas. And along comes Bodine with him. Remember that number eight is third. Bodine in fourth. Sorting themselves out around lap traffic. Down they come out of turn number four. In front of the crowd. Cars jiggling here just a little. Settling down as they come into turn number one. Tim Richmond, a lap down, leads the field. Gant is first place in the race. Elliott in second for red number nine. And then the youngster, Bobby Hillen, out of Midland, Texas, is in third. Gant now closes back in on Tim Richmond. He wants to put him a lap down. He's using his draft right now. If Richmond is a little bit faster than he, that works to Gant's advantage because he can run in his draft, but he says he's not fast enough. I got to go because Bill Elliott's coming. 19 laps to go this time by. One of Petty's crewmen. Looks like he's wrenched his right leg. Let's go to Chris. Attempt. Okay, that's Johnny Brown, one of Richard Petty's crew members, whose right knee came out of joint. And his fellow crew members are taking him to the infirmary for treatment. Tough break for one of Richard Petty's men. Back straight away, out of two. Gant in first. Elliott right there, trying to turn it around. Capacity House, biggest crowd in history here at Michigan. Loving every minute of it. Bodine sorts himself out, and he comes on. Gant first. Elliott second. Crash in turn number four. Two cars spinning, sliding down to the inside. Rusty Wallace, number 27, is one of them. And now there are more. Two Chet Phillip cars. was one of the cars. Neil Bonnie was one of the cars. Here's Chet Phillip as he comes down the road with the front end bashed and on Ricky his car. Rudd was in it. Here's Rusty Wallace now rolling. pulling back out. Neil Bonnie went down pit road. He didn't stop at his pits. He went straight on through. Ricky Rudd's 15, Neil Bonnet's number 12, Chet Phillips 81, and the Rusty Wallace car involved in this incident at turn four. Chet Phillips, who was having a, the best run of his life here today, had moved up in the top 10 at one point, but now sitting on pit road with a lot of sheet metal damage. 182 complete. Here's Chris. Okay, well, they're doing furious work on the front of this number 81 car driven by Chet Phillip. As you can see, the, it used to be sheet metal, but now it's more like fiberglass being wrenched off. The left front tire is flat. There's a lot of emergency repairs going to take place here. Just a week ago, a car in a different race, and they've just decided to give up. They're showing the frustration. Phillip will be getting out of the car. We'll be getting a word with him as he comes to us. Let's go down to Mike Joy now. Ricky Rudd was one of the first cars involved in the incident, but he's managed to limp around a pit road. And you see he's made heavy contact along the left side. Bud Moore is literally pulling out that steel fender with his hands. The front face of the car is fiberglass. Don't worry about that. They'll tape it. What's critical here is did Ricky bend up the front suspension or did he knock the rear end out of line? He is okay. Let's go to Chris. All right, here's Chet Phillips is getting out of the car. We're going to try and get a word with him here as he slides out of this damaged machine. He's a big, lanky Texan from Ozona. Hey, Chet, he's soaking wet with perspiration. He's having a hard time getting out, and he really looks really worn out from this episode that he's undergone here. There come the goggles off, and the men are still really sure. Chet, you all right? Yeah. What, what, what triggered all that? Uh, 
couple guys spun, and uh, Bonnet slowed down in front of me, and I, I couldn't slow down enough to keep from hitting him in the rear. How hard was the hit? I hit him pretty hard. Yeah. Okay, Chet Phillips, a disappointed boy from Texas getting out of the car, and he looks like his left foot might be bothering him just a little bit. They got the engine fired up, and they're working on the front end, but it's doubtful that he'll get back in in the short time remaining. Down pit road to Mike Joy. Bud Moore is talking with Harold Stott, one of his crewmen. They're going to bring Ricky back in. One of the crewmen has a long piece of string here. No, that's not to tie the car back together, but they'll use it to realign the front end. Ricky did bend the front suspension, probably the tie rod, and it kept the front wheels from both pointing exactly straight ahead. We'll talk to them after they get their service completed. Here is Ricky coming back down pit road. There's Neil Bonnet with a tire rubbing. 184 laps are complete. Let's take a look at a replay of this incident in turn four. Ricky Rudd's car already, Neil Bonnet spinning to avoid. Chet Phillip has collected Bonnet on the outside. Well, actually, Chet Phillip hit uh, Bonnet from behind yep. as Bonnet slowed down to try to avoid the other cars. Let's take a look from inside Richard Petty's car, back in 15th, 18th position. Well, you can see the smoke began to boil in front of him, and again today, Richard Petty didn't have any, any vision in front of it as the smoke just... Uh, he, he just kept it straight, and the smoke boiled, and he drove right on through it. A lot of folks out here today rooting for Richard Petty to have a great one. Here's number 12, Bonnet on pit road. He did get a good lick from the rear, Ken. Oh, yeah. The right rear frame is bound to be bent on that car. There's Tim Brewer, Doug Richard, the rest of the crew looking it over to see if they can repair the damage that's done, or enough to get him back in the race. Car number four, Wilson, is on pit road. They continue to work on Neil Bonnet's car. He's had nothing but misfortune after misfortune this year. He's had a bad year, no question about it. He's run good in a lot of races, including the Daytona 500. We last saw him on CBS, but uh, he just had so many problems. The sense is that uh, in another year, well, might see Bonnet and Waltrip moving on from that Junior Johnson team. There's Richard Petty. I think we can get a word. Dale Inman says we can talk to uh, Richard Petty. Richard? Yeah. Another close call today. Yeah, I tell you, it's been my day because I ain't got in trouble, but it's not been my day because I've been too close to it all. Well, we're looking at it again right now. What did you see as you came up on it? A lot of blue smoke. <laughs> Tire smoke, not engine smoke, right? Well, yeah, the uh, 15 got high and came down, hit 27, and when they spun, tire smoke went everywhere, and I just went straight because I figured it'd go back to the infield. Thank you very much. Okay. Experience tells you to do those things, Ken. More from Michigan in a moment. <laughs> I would say that Richard Petty's 1,000 start ranks right up there with Pete Rose breaking Ty Cobb's hit record, Hank Aaron beating Babe Ruth's home run record, Fran Tarkenton setting all of those records for passing in football. It's on a level with all of these accomplishments, and I think it should be recognized that way. Harry Gant is being challenged by Bill Elliott for the lead. Bodine, Hill, and Baker making up the top five. And up front, we have a battle that's wheel to wheel for the lead. Elliott is on the inside. Harry Gant on the outside. Bodine right there. Those three. 12 laps to go now. Here this is it. The time has come. To whatever you have, if you had anything left, you got to show it now. Harry Gant going back to first. Elliott in second. take us into victory lane for the second time this year. He did it at Daytona. Buddy Baker is in fourth. Bobby Hill in fifth. Waltrip sixth. Earnhardt seventh. Rutman eighth. Wilson ninth. Ricky Rudd tenth. Labonte eleventh. Labonte a lap down. Richard Petty is being shown in twelfth. And he has just gone around Terry Labonte, so that would move him up another notch. Petty has run good today, but he lost that lap early and he's never been able to get back. Get down the lap on this track tracks get a little help just because of the size of them and here with the cautions we've had eight cautions which equals the record for caution set in 1969 
and 44 laps under caution is the new record, the old record 43 in that year of 69. Well, there you see them. Gary Gant at number 33 and number 9, Bill Elliott. But the spoiler, maybe right there, number 5, Bodine. And how about Baker today? That's right. He's, no, he's going to be to contend with. He's hungry, Ken. He's as hungry as anybody out there for a win. Gant and Elliott trying to get away from the rest of the field. In pursuit, number 5, definitely moving up. Jeff Bodine. Then it's about 15, 20 car lengths back to Buddy Baker. Well, now, Gant and Elliott have been able to pull away a little bit from Bodine when he was up there battling with them for the position a moment ago. And remember that when Bodine was running free and easy by himself and leaving everybody? But he couldn't run that well in traffic, and now he's in traffic. There's Gary Nelson, his crew chief. Bodine's crew chief. Staying fourth, Baker. Tommy the, Allison. The windshield of, of Jeff Bodine's cars. He sees the two front cars getting away from him. Mike Walter, real slow, bottom of the racetrack you saw him there. Travis Carter looking on, his car in front. They desperately need a win. After that terrible wreck a week ago, incredible just to see Harry Gant walk out and get in the car. But now, he feels like he's in a rocking chair. He's where he loves to be. Elliott moves in again. Great General Motors Ford battle. Tremendous crowd here. The Elliott pits. Dan Elliott there. All they can do is sit there and watch and hope and pray. They've done all they can do. The Bodine pits, anxiously looking on. Laps running down. Big wide corner. Gant almost turned it sideways. He had so much power on that time. He watched this one. Hal Needham flew in from California to see him make this run today. So disappointed after coming so close last week and then that terrible wreck. Ken, I believe that Bill Elliott will sit there until maybe the last lap uh, and, and try to pull it off. Gant's car got a little loose again yep. as it came off of that turn. We've seen it be frisky in that same spot before. Mm -hmm. There's a little bit of a rough spot down on the inside of that fourth turn. It's the only flaw in the pavement here at Michigan. I thought he was above the rough spot. Well, I don't know. His left wheels could have been in. Yep. The rough spot was only about eight or nine feet out. Let's watch him this time through it. But that's exactly where he had trouble before, about 80, 90 miles ago. Average speed's 137.2. No records to be set here today with eight caution periods. Now, the interesting situation is, as these two continue their race, they are drawing away by almost three-quarters of a second from third spot, Jeff Bodine, and closing on Bodine is the Baker uh, Baker car. Buddy Baker having an awesome good run here today. Last lap strategy, Mike Joy. Travis, he's talking to Harry Gant right now on the radio as Gant comes down into turn number one, and they give him the lap times, and ask our official indicates laps to go. See if we can catch a quick word. Last lap strategy. Can there be any when you're out in front? You saw the look and the laugh. All you can do is run as hard as you can. Chris? Okay, here's Gary Nelson. Gary with with uh, with Buddy Baker and hooking up with Jeff. Will that improve Jeff's performance when he's close to Baker like that? Uh, yeah, it will. I don't think there's enough time. Uh, and I don't think Baker's going to hook up. I think they're going to do some side-by-side -side racing, and that'll hurt us. Uh, it would be nice if Baker would help push us up to the front. Okay, thank you very much, Gary Nelson. Jeff Bodine, Suski. Bill Elliott observing every move by Gant here. I think Ned hit it right on the nose. He looks inside, he looks outside, and he waits. Laps running down. Let's check on what the Elliott pits are thinking these moments. Journey Elliott, it seems every time we come down here, they're talking to their driver on the radio, getting a look as Bill comes past, feeding the lap times, Ernie and brother Dan. Ernie's deep in conversation. We'll get a quick word with Dan. Is he going to wait to the last lap? Do you know? Do you think he knows right now? He's not waiting. He's going. He's gone. He's to the inside. Elliott's making his move. He's not waiting for those last moments. A little surprising, Jim, that he would make the move that early, but maybe he figures he's got enough left. He's in his rearview mirror while he was running behind Gant. They were able to pull away from the third-place car. He says,
says we're far enough away now, so let me go ahead and see if I can make the move and stay out there. And that's the conversation you saw Ernie Elliott having. They decided it was the time. 197 this time by. Gans crew. Anxious. Concerned. A little despondent, perhaps. Here's Gant getting ready to remount a charge. Coming on the counterattack, Harry Gant, time running out in our live coverage of the Michigan 400. Well, now, you maybe reckon Harry let him go by, and he's, he's going to make the slingshot on the last lap. A lot, of, lot going on here now. Takes that wide sweep going around Rusty Wallace in that incident a few moments ago. Back straight away. Where would you like to be right now, Mr. Jarrett? Well, I think as if, he, if he has it to do it with, he'll have to start making his move as he comes off of turn two and pass him going into turn three. If he can do it. Elliott is right. I don't think he can do it. We'll see. Camp pulls in. Camp pulls into the inside for a moment. Two to go. Two laps to go, and Baker closes up on Bodine if we look a little further back. Leaders. Elliott draws away a bit here. Back straight away. Coming up for the white flag. Lap remaining. They come by this time. Gantz there. He's uh, using the draft to good advantage, moving in. Elliott just seems to pull away when he gets about halfway down the straightaway. What will this be, 11th different winner between either of these two? Neither of these drivers have won so far this year. Elliott won the special race for the winners from last year. $200,000 that he collected in Atlanta. Here's the white flag, one to go. Take your choice. Who's it like to be first or like to be second? Bill Elliott is there on the point. Harry Gant, number 33, riding second. Last lap of the Michigan 400 here on CBS. Into the back straightaway. And he'll never be able to do it, I don't think. He needed to do it a little bit earlier to make, try to make that move. He needs to be up beside of him right now, or, or inching up beside of him, and he hasn't caught him yet. Holds up. 15 car lengths right there. He moves in closer as he goes into the turn. He's really going to have to get some acceleration off of this turn if he's going to do it. Coming down for the finish. Out of the fourth turn, last time. Gant goes all the way to the wall, tries to find anything with which to pull a slingshot. It's not to be had. And car number nine, Bill Elliott wins his first race of 1986. He's third in a row in the Michigan 400. Harry Gant with an amazing comeback from disaster a week ago, places second and steaming across the finish line in third, Jeff Bonai with Buddy Baker driving a beautiful fourth. Ernie Elliott walking out along with the crew scoring their first win, Elliott's 15th Super Speedway victory on oval tracks of one mile or more in length. Bill Elliott has finally taken the monkey off his back and won a race this year. Well, this will be a big boost for that team, Ken. They needed it. There's Jeff Bodine. Finished third. You're inside of his car on the cool down lap now. Richard Petty's automobile coming in. Petty closes out today, finishing 13th. That's unofficial at the moment. Richard Petty for 13th position, getting a lap down early. Bill Elliott to go to victory lane. We'll be meeting him there in just a moment. The remainder of the field pulling back into the garage area. Getting set to head on to Daytona Beach, Florida for the Firecracker 400. Well, this is the form that we saw him last year when he won 11 Super Speedway events. Ah. Well, the press was right. They took Elliott. Sure did. They took Earnhardt, second, Great. in their TV selection. TV. The drivers thought that Harry Gant was going to be the man today. They were not all that wrong. Uh, were that was a great TV. race. Just a wonderful race. And a smile, a look of success on Bill Elliott. Whoa. After waiting, calculating, and driving as good a race as Dale Earnhardt won in winning the uh, 600 at Charlotte this year. That was a superlative effort by Earnhardt. And here's a great performance this afternoon by Bill Elliott. Oh, oh they're happy. I'm back Bill. in the saddle again, he says. Yes, I am. Okay, well, let's go to Chris. Uh, Bill Elliott wiping the grime and collected grease from his face as he unstraps himself and starts to climb out of this red number nine Thunderbird. There he with a big happy wave. And that's a smile we haven't seen all year long, Bill. Congratulations.
Well, I felt like I was never going to get here, but, you know, it seemed like the first part of the race that, you know, it wasn't meant for me to be here today, but we kept on working with the car. You know, and the crew got good there at the end of the race, and we put it together. I was going to ask you, were you waiting, or were you going as hard as you could all day? Well, I was really concerned about tires at the first of the race, because everybody was blistering some, and I blistered some, and then finally we got the car worked out to where it stayed consistent with what it had, and I was tickled to death with it. Well, you're back home again, so to speak, Victory Lane and your car owner's hometown. It must be a great feeling. No doubt about it. It's really great. Okay, how are you going to celebrate, Bill? You're a quiet kind of guy. Tell us a little bit about that. Later well, on. I think I'm going to go out and really party tonight. There you go. Why not? Bill Elliott, who hasn't won a regular season race all year long, is going to party tonight in the big way. Now let's go down the track to Mike Joy. How many times over all these years have we heard that phrase? Well, here's second place Harry. I thought you had him stumped today, and I think maybe you did too. Well, I did till old Bill come up there to last, uh, and I seen he was real strong. Uh, my car was, it was really kind of weak. It didn't handle real good. I mean, perfect. But to stay with him, I had to stay right in the draft and try to make up some time in the corners because if he had ever got another 100 feet earlier, I, before the last caution, you know, I couldn't keep up with him. He was strong. And when he was behind me running out there, my last set of tar was just a little bit loose. There was a possibility of maybe if I could keep him behind, you know, I might have beat him. But I was a little loose in the corner, and he passed me with ease. <laughs> But now, can he move your car around a bit when he's trailing you in the draft if he sees you're a little loose and that back end's wanting to kick out? Well, not that much here. You do normally, but here, uh, it didn't really seem like. I was just a little loose anyway, and uh, it took a, a more laps I ran, the better it got. Now, the last two laps, the car began to go through three much, much better. But, uh, yeah, he ran awful strong, you know. It's really been hard to beat him. You were very slow climbing into the car this morning after that wreck seven days ago. You climbed out of it with a little more energy after racing 400 miles. I guess... The adrenaline builds up, and you get to feel a little better when you can race that hard and have a shot to win. Yeah, I felt real good. I didn't have any pain, you know, from my ribs or anything. That was good. I, I was worried about if I could take a deep breath without it hurting too bad, and uh, it worked okay. Uh, might have been a little tireder, but the pain wasn't there, and that's what really mattered. Well, you finished second in this race in 1981, but it only paid about $12,000 then. <laughs> yeah. I don't wait for day. We're sure needing a win real bad. Uh, you know, I, I knew it was going to be very, very tough out there when Bill was running that strong, and... I just hope I could hang on, but uh, and I really thought I might have had a shot at getting back at him because uh, the longer we ran, it seemed like I could equal him a little bit better, but they just wasn't that long enough laps left. NASCAR has tried real hard to achieve parity between the various makes of cars, and looking at the Chevy Ford battle at the end of this race today, would you say they've done that? Yeah, pretty good. You know, the Ford's still a much smaller car than Chevrolet. Uh, they still got a big advantage. Okay, let's go back upstairs. <laughs> We'll have more of the story here of this Michigan 400 and this outstanding victory for Bill Elliott in a moment. Here at Michigan, right now we're ready to meet the man who had his 1,000th race today. Let's meet Richard Petty. Well, Richard, a winner in one out of five starts, and today just wasn't one of those five for you. No, I, we had a little problem to begin with. Uh, had a little trouble with the tire there, and then uh, I run a few laps and finally figured out that's what it was. Came in, changed tires, went back out, and uh, then uh, the 33 came up and lapped me. And just as they lapped me, they threw the caution flag. Instead of throwing them to the lap earlier, they, one of them deals where you feel like that they said, hey, we got him a lap down now, we'll, we'll throw a caution. And that's the way it looked to me. You know? Well, in a 1,000 starts, you get some good breaks along with some of these bad ones. Well, yeah, you're right. I, I, got, I got some good breaks out there today. Though. I was close to that couple of uh, uh, where I won blown engines and one wreck and stuff like that. And I was... You know, you got to thank you, Lucky Stars, that you got through something like that. Even though you had bad luck on one hand, you had to have good luck on the other hand to be able to be here and talk to you. You've done this for so many years and so many races, but you've told me often that of all the things you do during the week, when you climb in that race car and drop the window net and close out the outside world, that's the highlight of your week. That's got to be still true, looking at the smile on your face. Well, I had me a big time. I was racing with Bobby Hill in there right at the last race. He was a lap ahead of me, but I was making him work for it. You know what I mean? Instead of just letting him go, I... I said, well, heck, if I'm out here, I want to race with somebody. So I, me and him had a pretty good race going. And I didn't let him beat me. He just beat me on his own. <laughs> well, that's NASCAR's all-time winningest and racingest driver, Richard Petty. Ken? All of the, of the people who participate in this sport that make it so special to me, men like Bill Elliott in victory lane today and Harry Gant, who challenged him so brilliantly at the end, and men like Richard Petty. Richard Petty perhaps said it better for all of them than anyone did when he said, I don't think I'll be remembered as the best race car driver there has ever been or the most popular or any of that stuff. But the overall picture is that I want to leave a good impression that I was somebody that did something that I did a pretty good job of it 
and enjoyed every dadgum minute of it. Richard Petty. We'll be back with more of the results and the story of the Michigan 400 in a moment. It was Father's Day, 1986, when the sun finally came out for Bill Elliott on this season. Victorious over Harry Gann in second place, Jeff Bodine third, Buddy Baker fourth, Darrell Waltrip coming home in fifth, still looking to win this event for the first time. Sixth was Earnhardt, seventh was Bobby Hillen, eighth, Rick Wilson, ninth, Joe Rutman, and tenth was Ricky Rudd. Taking a look at 11 through 15, Bobby Allison, followed by Terry Labonte, then Richard Petty, Jimmy Ellis, and Alan Kulwicki had a good run today. And rounding out the uh, top 20, Poncho Carter, Rusty Wallace, Mike Waltrip, Jim Richmond, Neil Bonnet. A new record for laps under caution, some 44 today. And of course, we had eight caution periods, which kept the speed down to 139 miles per hour. Give it to Bill Elliott today, but he didn't have it given to him. He took it the hard way, riding hard with Harry Gant right to the finish. And so for Chris Economaki, Mike Joy, and Ed Jarrett, I'm Ken Squire saying so long from the Michigan International Speedway. This CBS Sports Special, the Michigan 400, has been sponsored by Budweiser. Beachwood aged for that clean, crisp taste. This Bud's for you. Ford and your Ford dealer. Have you driven a Ford lately? And by AC Delco, the smart parts.